DB AM. With Gillette, get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. You are very welcome along to Thursday morning's OTB AM. We're now just three days away from the 135th All-Ireland Football Final. It is a chance, potentially, for Kerry to lift a record 38th Sam Maguire this Sunday, while Galway hoping to bridge a 21-year gap to potentially lift the Sam for the 10th time in their history. It's a third time in charge for Jack O'Connor, the Kerry boss. The league champions hoping to complete a double like they did under Jack O'Connor in 2009. He could potentially win his fourth title as boss, while Porrick Joyce twice a winner as Galway with a player uh, could also oversteer and see his side uh, lift the Sam Maguire as a manager as well. So we're looking forward to that. We've got one foot very much in the Galway camp today with plenty of reaction from the City of the Tribes. We'll be in the Kingdom tomorrow. So we have sent along the keeper of the era, the lead man inside the Kerry Mafia, particularly the Dublin division of the Kerry Mafia, Owen Sheehan, who is down by the seaside on this Thursday morning. Owen, how are you getting on? Very well, Will. A very good morning to you. How are you keeping? Yeah, I'm good. I'm looking forward to this final because it's been a while since these two teams have even met in championship. We have to go back to the Super 8s back in 2018. We're going to have Kevin Walsh with us who was in charge of Galway for that three-point win back then, a little bit later in the show, to break down uh, some of the main matchups. But there's a real kind of fresh feel about this. We can you know, talk about the league a couple of years ago where David Clifford ran riot in Tralee, but they haven't met each other in a couple of years. It's almost a bit like Kilkenny and Limerick for the hurling final where they hadn't met in championship since 2019. So for me, there's a real freshness about this first time since 2014 that we've had not one of the finalists from last year in it so I don't know I mean obviously you're going to be nervous from a Kerry perspective but for me there's a real newness about this final this coming Sunday and I think that probably speaks to why a lot of people want to see Galway win this weekend as well just a sense of a, a new champion and while Kerry may not have got the job done in eight years it is still a very much a sense that if they won, it would kind of feel normal. I know it doesn't; it won't feel normal to a lot of Kerry people at all if, if they win, but it does feel Kerry, Tyrone, Dublin, Mayo, even though only two of those counties have won All-Irelands over the eight years, have, have sort of sewn the whole thing up. Galway, uh, as they did in 1998, have not come from nowhere, but they've sort of arrived with a perfect deal of momentum and could strike while they are in a sock, just like they did in, in 98. Like, I mean, being around the city and around the county yesterday, there are very, very unavoidable parallels with, with that team, whether it's Park Joyce himself or, or a couple of other factors. They definitely feel that there is a big chance that they do arrive in the scene and they do just show up and win it. And we will be sitting here in a week's time watching the celebrations in, in Air Square or Toome. And we'll also have a second edition of A Year Till Sunday coming out. So this is what people are looking out for uh, over the, the next couple of weeks, These this sort of throwback to, to 1998. Speaking about arrivals, when you went west of the Shannon, car mm. trouble started to hit, and it was a, a kindly OTB fan who came to your rescue in your hour of need. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure it was an OTB fan, just a, a, a genuine sound lad, to be honest. I, as soon as I hit the Galway sign, like the, the welcome to Galway sign, my car started flashing. You know when you get all those flashing lights in the dashboard? The ones you ignore, yeah. yeah. The ones that you ignore. It's like hieroglyphics to me. I don't know anything about cars. And uh, it was just like, okay, I've got to get all the way out to Connemara and back to the city and up to Tume and back to the city. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to to sort anything out here. But I was in uh, to Taft's pub yesterday with uh, Park and and Martin Lally and I was uh, explaining my predicament to them. And they said, go down to the docks to VP Motors and they will sort you out. We just bought a car from there recently and I went down to VP Motors and uh, Fergal inside there, Fergal O'Boyle, an absolute gentleman. Uh, he sorted me out straight away, fixed whatever needed to be fixed. He told me what was wrong with the car but that went straight over my head because I don't know anything about cars and uh, he managed to save the rest of the Galway trip but most importantly, the Kerry trip today. I thought I was going to be stuck in, in Galway, Will, and uh, I thought Galway would have me now which uh, I guess might have, might have been better for the Kerry people to be honest before we build this hype over the next two days. Oh, can you imagine the accusations of Yera if you hadn't actually made it down to the Kingdom for tomorrow? A two-day Galway special just hyping up all the pressure on Galway. We're not going to hear from Kerry whatsoever ahead of Sunday. It's going to be Kerry doing their talking on the pitch on. Yeah, well, exactly. I mean, you're, 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 you seem to be speaking a, a pretty good message there, Will. I, I do think Galway are, are kind of... Um, not. I don't think Galway people like the Yera at all. I think they're actually just kind of more straight up than any other GEA fan I've met. They're kind of like, we don't want to talk about this thing until it's done. We I, we don't want to like envisage the fact that there could be celebrations until it's done. We're not going to be planning any homecoming or celebrations until this thing is done. And they're straight up about it. You know, at least 
carry people and Kilkenny people as I discovered last week kind of like to downplay the chances Galway are confident Galway know that they have a very very good chance of winning but they also realise the fact that they can't see the future they can't predict for sure what's going to happen and they just don't know if they're going to be happy next week or not there is also and you'll see it across the, the, the course of this morning there's also a lot of kind of like sly references to Mayo and all of that you know their they're neighbouring county who do like to think about what the, the celebrations might look like I mean if you are a Mayo person how else are you going to get by on a year to year basis unless you do envisage the, the happier days coming down the line but Galway are very much saying we are not falling into that trap. We will do our celebrating when that final ball is kicked and when Galway have more points scored than Kerry on Sunday afternoon. Yeah, I did wonder about that watching Colin Boyle last night in OTB and watching Lee Keegan yesterday and both true kind of gritted teeth said, no, we'd be happy for our neighbours if they were to bring the <laughs> Sam Maguire back across the Shannon. And both were kind of tipping up the fact that Galway could run this one very close this coming weekend. But there has to be party that wonders Mayo have been to so many finals, particularly over the last decade. We talked earlier in the year about, you know, Galway's record at Crow Park was poor since 2001. And here they are, where they've been underdog in quite a few of the games that they've played so far this year, maybe with the exception of the Connacht final. And now they are 70 minutes away from potentially bridging that two decade gap. Yeah, like I'd almost be a little bit more worried if they were favourites going into this game. The underdog status has suited them perfectly. Like, I I mean, I tipped Derry to beat them in the semi-final. Derry were favourites for that game. In hindsight, that looked ludicrous, given the gulf between the teams that we saw exposed in that second half. A similar thing could go with even the Connacht final. And I know you said that they were probably favourites for that, but it was close. Mm. And it seems ludicrous as well that they were beaten in that league final in Crow Park earlier this year. So they have embraced this underdog tag perfectly in every single game and not in the sort of siege mentality sense but I, I don't know they, is it the style of play thing is it the way they set up but I, the Galway as underdogs is a, is a fairly dangerous prospect and it has proven to be so over the course of the entire year and just to go back to that 98 point I think Porrick Joyce probably knows better than anybody else that you don't need to lose one to win one you can show up and win on your first occasion Galway know that you can show up and win on your first occasion and I think that that'll be the message to the players this week not the sort of you know ah oh, you're underdogs do your best it is I mean we may not be back here again we have to win now and if we win now chances are it'll increase the probability we will be back again next time so there's a winning culture in this county Will they're the third the third on the roll of honour and I think sometimes people forget that yeah, and the last Connacht team to beat Kerry in an All-Ireland final. Albeit, you have to go back to 1965 for that, which just goes to show the record that uh, Connacht teams, and Mayo will be the first one to tell you about their record against Kerry in All-Ireland finals in recent times. And we're going to hear a bit from uh, some of the reaction that you've been getting from around about the city, but you went to the heartland of Galway football as well, if you went to Toome and taken in a bit of Connemara as well. Exactly, exactly, yeah. So uh, I went up to Toome to, to meet a couple of people yesterday. We met a, a great Galway super fan, a piece we'll bring you a little bit later on. But of course, Toome is uh, one of the homes of the Saw Doctors as well. So uh, I went up there yesterday and uh, I met Leo Moran, who is uh, obviously one of the, the, the key founders of, uh, of the Saw Doctors. Uh, what I don't know is if people are aware of the Saw Doctors side project or the Saw Doctors Breakaway Act, which is uh, Leo and uh, Park Stevens, uh, the two-man ma- bands, the folk footballers, that released an album in 2001 based on football. It was a football album, and it's on Spotify. If people want to check it out, you can look up the folk footballers, and they're playing gigs at the moment. They might be releasing a little bit of new material over the next few weeks, but this isn't something that I was overly aware of. I'm sure everybody in Galway was but it's not something that I was overly aware of like this was uh, that album that they released was uh, one of the the first times we heard the the, the maroon and white of uh, Galway obviously uh, Saw Doctors had uh, just a a mirror image for that song for for their neighbours above in Mayo and then they had a a host of other songs about you know heartbreak and sport and uh, going up to the 1959 All-Ireland so I I went out to Toome to to meet the folk footballers so uh, on the left hand side we have Leo Moran and uh, on the right hand side uh, we have Park Stevens who is uh, another uh, former member of the Saw Doctors so have a look and have a listen to to their tunes All right, we'll have a look at the uh, Saw Doctors just in a moment just to tell you what is coming up because OTBM is brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day Uh, we're going to have plenty of Owens content from Galway over the next hour hour and a half or so Um, as we heard there we're going to hear from the Saw Doctors and get a live performance from the Saw Doctors as well in a moment Uh, then we will be uh, hearing from Taft's Bar some of these places that Owen has been visiting on his trip across the Shannon Uh, Kevin Walsh is going to join us in the next hour, the former Galway boss who was in charge in the Super 8s, uh, now coming up four years ago at this stage where they won 113 to 110 against the Kingdom. 
he's going to be looking at some of the main matchups uh, from the game at the weekend and trying to stop David Clifford who scored three goals and five points uh, the last time that Kerry played against Galway is going to be particularly intriguing and then Ollie Turner from Galway Bay FM is going to be with us to give us a perspective from Galway ahead of the big game on Sunday and then some Brian O'Driscoll goodness breaking down the third test and Ireland's historic series victory against the All Blacks from last weekend from last night's show with Joe right as Owen mentioned here's some of the Saw Doctors from his uh, visits around Galway yesterday it's the Wednesday before the All Ireland and we're in tune in County Galway with the folk footballers we have a load of songs about Galway football for instance Galway come on come on Come on, go away We'll be coming from the city We'll be coming from Tune Coming on the Sunday afternoon Heading out the Dublin Road and Heading off to Ballon the Slow there was an article in an uh, old magazine I found in the house. It had a great picture of Dermot Early catching a high ball over Willie Joyce on the cover. And it was an old Connacht uh, ma- um, annual magazine. And there was a misprint. They wanted to talk about football folk, but it, they got the they got the, uh, printing. the printing mixed up. So it's, it, instead of saying football folk, it was folk football. So we thought, that's a good one. Right, so that's where the name came from. Yeah. Come on, come on. My name is Paul Stevens, and my partner Leo Morland wrote a song that has taken Galway by storm. <laughs> it's called The Maroon and White Forever. It's a very small storm, though. What key is it? G. Dreamt I'd wear the jersey all Ireland final day. I'd stand out there in Crow Park, the mighty part to play. We'd run out of the tunnel to a great big Galway road. We'd have our picture taken and head down to the goal. Line up with the captain. March behind the band And when they play the anthem We'd face the flag above the stand Cause me heart is in maroon and white I'll stick with what I know Maroon and white forever No matter where I go I mean, it's interesting, isn't it, when you kind of like chart the, the, the wider Saw Doctors universe and you've got the maroon and white and Green and red, because it uh, was an answer song to, to the green and red. It wasn't really the green and red. Just illustrates really how our rivalry with Mayo is a, is a wonderfully friendly rivalry, ninety five percent of the time. <laughs> and there's huge connections with Mayo here too. But the schools here had borders from Mayo for decades, and loads of people came from Mayo and came back to work here and got married here and all that. So there's loads of connections. Moon and white forever. In hailstones, rain or snow Yes, maroon and white forever It's what I always say Maroon and white a Galway Forever and a day The maroon and white of Galway Forever Another one, Park. We were watching Kelly uh, last week, and the last kick of the game was uh, a big, long flea. And the goalie came up, he wanted to take it, but by Jimmy, he didn't get it. Leave me alone. <laughs> so, the lad who takes that flea in the last kick of the game, this is his song. Let us play, we'll play, and 
aren't as bold as our fathers before. There's one chance to win, another to go. It's a chance in a million. I'll give it a try. Kicking into the wind with the sun in my eyes. Yes, we all know the story, history of old. How that bad blood got started the day that got stole. Still don't like losing. Do you remember the one about uh, Sean Postle and Frank Stop? And have a go at it. I never saw them play, but I heard about their feats. How one would get the ball and know where the other one would be. And we share in all the glory of their legendary wins. John Purcell and Frank Stockwell, the terrible twins. They both grew up together up above in Bishop Street. Twas football for the breakfast, the dinner and the tea. Sure, kicking on the street is where so many dreams begin. John Purcell and Frank Stockwell, Terrible twin. September 1959, Galway playing Kelly in the fight. And I was put in the back of the mall, smile. My father and John Higgins were in the front. And my mother made him alone a white flag. And we hung it out the window. And by the time we were 20 miles up the road, like that. The weave, the vertical weave of the flag had, had flown away. It, all it was, it, it, it hadn't been, there was no time to hem the flag. We're heading into the sunrise, coming from the west. The flag we flew fluttered, we're bringing the best. That day in September, sun shone through the mist. We was going to the All Ireland, silver money in my fist. We used to listen in the kitchen to me hollow hair when the wonder of the wildest was holy as prayer. Heroes and legends on top of my list. Now I'm going to the All Ireland, silver money in my fist. I love that the one about remember the medals, remember the suits, mm. and all the all the glamour and the crack that goes around, and All Ireland win. Because when Galway won the All Ireland in '98, it had no precedent in in our lifetime, in my lifetime anyway. So we didn't know actually what happened. Remember the medals, remember the suits. This is the time to face the truth. We want another one. We want to win another one. We want another one. We want to win another one. Dig in. Dig in. Dig deep. Dig it, dig it, dig it till you do it in your sleep. Dig in, dig deep, dig it, dig it, dig it till you do it in your sleep. We want another one, we want to win another one, we want another one. Want to win another one? I think it's half time now, lad. <laughs>
the folk footballers there here on OTBAM from Galway ahead of the final this coming Sunday. Owen, you've been blessed musically over your trips, uh, you know, given that you were talking about the Cranberries last week in Limerick and you know, Galway have got the Saw Doctors to give them you know, their most important songs when it comes to celebration around the GAA. Tell me this, why are Kerry still using the Rose of Tralee? One of the most traditional songs will play out if Kerry land number 38 at the weekend. Yeah, it's a, it's a cool question, Will. I think in, in, in 2014, I, did, um, I, did, I it maybe played... Did it play? I think it played maybe oh, it played, straight after. Crow Park always plays the Rose Tralee. Yeah, and then, but then, like, the next song afterwards was, like, the current script song at the time or something. Like, there is, like, a dearth of... It was probably Hall of Fame, songs wasn't it? ...that are well-known. Uh, yeah, exactly, exactly. That's probably still used. Is it? That's, like, the most uh, kind of, like, mainstream GEA song that's ever been written. Like, it just goes to, like, highlights packages of mid-2010s football. Uh, like, so, I mean, yeah, you're kind of a little bit jealous when uh, Limerick have the Cranberries and uh, Galway have the Saw Doctors and the Kerry are still stuck with Rosa Tralee. But, uh, you know what, it is what it is. There are lyrics in it that match the county, so I, you can't really complain. Uh, there has to be better out there. Like, I'm... I, I, uh, I, Forgive me for not having a couple of alternatives to hand here because there definitely are uh, a few that, that could be used. But uh, I know it's it has been a topic of conversation within Kerry supporters. It's like, could we do just maybe a little bit better? Well, the production team are saying, why not Christy Hennessy if you want to update a little bit here on? Colin's a big fan of uh, Christy Hennessy, actually, and uh, I, I would defer to his greater knowledge uh, on, on his work. And again, uh, you'll just have to forgive me for maybe kind of a, a lack of, of, of bringing information to the table. There's but a culture of black spot for you, right? Uh, not, yes, yes, so yeah, no, yes, yeah. Uh, <laughs> let me do my, let me do my homework and come up with a few options. I, I should say I, I maybe need to speak to people maybe a little bit older than me just to kind of get a, a real sense of what the county wants. It's a good question, Will. It's a good. We'll put that to the people of Kerry maybe today. What should? Um, or maybe people are really happy with the Rose of Tralee. Is it just me? Or maybe I'm the only person who's like, that's not actually a, a fantastic um, song to be blaring out of the speakers in Croke Park if you get over the line in an All-Ireland final. I think it's a little bit twee. I think it's a little bit old-fashioned. Yeah. I, th- I think yeah, there's definitely is. a... But then again, look, Kerry, you're all about tradition. They're all about what they've achieved over the last 130-odd <laughs> years and therefore maybe they like to use the traditional song. Um, what is the, uh, the feeling in Galway, by the way? We're going to get a look back at some of Galway's greatest now at the moment. I'm sure Porrick Joyce... Uh, uh, their current manager is going to be among them. But given that you've gone to three pretty disparate locations in Connemara, within the city and going to Toome, what is the feeling in Galway ahead of this weekend? They're very confident. Uh, right. Very confident. that, like They all accept that if Galway are to win, it will be an upset. They are not favourites. But the common theme is that the bookmakers have got it wrong with the magnitude of, of the of the odds that are against Galway. And like, to be fair, I did kind of pick up on this last week that... Kerry are shorter odds to win this football All Ireland than Limerick were to win the hurling All Ireland, which is bonkers when you think about the fact that Kerry haven't got over the line yet in football. And I think Galway have kind of picked up on that a little bit. They've maybe looked at the reaction to, to the Kerry Dublin win and said, listen, that looks like an All Ireland final celebration to me. We're not having that. Now, I will say, I don't think anybody in Kerry was celebrating winning an All Ireland two weeks ago. They were celebrating beating Dublin and winning it in absolutely unbelievable fashion. So I don't think anybody's been getting it carried away on that sense. But I can see why Galway people might want to, to use that to, to create the siege mentality. And I think that they just, they all, to, to a man and woman, they all believe that they are going to do it this weekend. They all think they're going to do it narrowly. Nobody's getting overconfident or anything like that. But everybody really does believe that an upset is going to, is on the cards and is going to happen this Sunday. Yeah, I don't really have that belief that people would think that given the drama and Sean O'Shea is free, that Kerry would see that as practically being an All-Ireland win of itself. Because look look at Galway, the round before in the quarterfinals coming through on penalties against Armagh with one of the really great championship matches. And I wonder if that's partly why a few of the neutrals, aside from the fact that, you know, uh, Kerry are the empire with all of their success coming into this final but also the fact that you know Galway have given us some very entertaining games throughout the championship notwithstanding the semi-final which wasn't necessarily their fault with the way it was played uh, but particularly the entertainment that people took from that epic game probably the best game of the championship this year themselves in Armagh Yeah that's very true and also as well you have to remember the scenes in the second half of Galway Derry when like Comer bangs in a couple of goals to celebration after the second goal. Like that's what sport is all about. Like if we didn't celebrate winning semi-finals, there wouldn't be a lot for anybody to be happy about. I think we should probably be as happy as we possibly can be with every sort of positive thing that our sports teams give us. And I think Galway and Kerry really enjoyed that along the way in different ways, mind you. Like, I mean, Kerry is, it was very much getting over the line against Dublin. Galway's story this summer has been proving people wrong. 
and getting over the line in, in those games. And a lot of people, including us, would have uh, tipped them not to get over the line in. So they're coming from different places, but they've all had like brilliant points in the journey so far. B- both journeys feel like that they are both destined in All-Ireland glory, if that makes any sense. Like, it feels like that Shawnee O'Shea kick can only result in an All-Ireland win. And it feels like Galway winning on penalties can only result in Galway winning the All-Ireland. But both of those things just can't possibly be true. Yeah, they're both beautifully set up for the Sunday game montage at around about half past nine on Sunday, depending on the result. I can see the tide coming in behind you at the moment, Owen. The tide waits for no man. You have to get to the kingdom a little (laughs) bit later on. So you've been getting some context about Galway and Galway's football history. Yeah, so th- this is a really interesting chat I did with uh, a guy called Leo Courtney. He's based not too far away from Tume uh, himself. He's uh, based in a, in a townland uh, called Caltra, not the Caltra of, uh, of Michael Meehan, a different Caltra. And he is an encyclopedia of Galway knowledge. I actually sat down with him for the best part of an hour. Uh, I've distilled it down to the the key 15 minutes here. And the majority of this, the second half of this chat is uh, about that Galway team of the great 1960s and also a little bit back to the 1950s and the arrival of Sean Purcell, who is widely regarded as one of the greatest Galway footballers of all time and one of the greatest footballers of all time. And we just don't know enough about him. So I got challenged with him about that. But at the start, uh, we have a, a good chat about all things current Galway. I was advised by Michael Meehan this week to go meet Leo Courtney. He is a Galway super fan. Um, I hope Michael doesn't uh, mind me uh, mentioning that he told me to go meet you. But you, you know Michael quite well. You'd have spoken to him after plenty again. Oh, yeah, I know Michael very well. Michael's our fourth top scorer in the Galway's history. He has scored 14 goals and 112 points for Galway. Yes, I'm a great friend. I know Michael Meehan very well. And you know his stats very well. Where does he rank in the pantheon of, of great Galway footballers? Well, I have him on my uh, pantheon of great Galway footballers. I have him on the local paper there in my top three in the last 25 years. Nice. Um, that's how I rate him. I put Parik Joyce, Michael Dunn and Michael Meehan. And I suppose Jarlett Fallon and Tommy Mannion, Shane Welsh. You could, you see, you could go from one to 20 and you'd still leave someone out. And they said, but Michael, Michael, yes, he was in third place all in, but Shane just pipped him the last day. Shane has gone into third now. Michael is down to fourth. And Cyril Dunn from the three in a row is in fifth. Right, very good. I am keen to talk about that three in a row team. when, before we do that, though, was the first time you remember being at a, a big Galway match in Crow Park? My first time at a big Galway match, believe it or not, in Crow Park was 67. That was at the league final in 67 between Galway and Dublin. Galway won at 12 points to Dublin won seven. And now, I don't think we have beaten Dublin in a major knockout game, well, semi-final or final stage, since that game in 67. Uh, it was the end of the, the first recall the Galway three in a row was in 63 we came through in Connacht and we beat Kerry in the All-Ireland semi-final it was a cr- low scoring first half four points to one but um, Galway came out in the second half Kerry were leading halfway through the second half seven points to two and then Pat Donnan of all people a midfielder Pat was at the right spot he scored a goal we got right back in it and we won one seven to eight points Dublin beat us in the final now we beat ourselves in the sense that we had 12 wides, Dublin had only four. Dublin scored one nine and we got 10 pints. We were disappointed, but it was, to, it was probably a blessing in this stars because we were a young team. And in 64, who did we meet in the All Ireland final? Kerry. It was a cracking game 15 pints to 10. All of the Galway six forward score that day was settled on getting nine. Uh, a great win, and there was a an old man up this side of the country at the time, and he says, well, to beat Kerry in an All-Ireland, it's worth two All-Irelands. We did it again in 65. Then the three in a row was competed in 1966 when we beat the Royal Meath, won 10 to 7 pints. Matty McDonough got a goal, and Matty was the Texaco winner. There was the old Texaco Award. Now it's Player of the Year. It was Player of the Year that time, which was the Texaco Award. Was Matty was the Player of the Year in 66. Noel Tierney was the Player of the Year in 64. And Martin Newell was the Player of the Year in 65. And when we came out of Crow Park in 66, if you were told back then that you wouldn't win another All-Ireland until 98, you would say there was something somewhere wrong. I'm looking forward to Sunday. Now, Kerry comes their side of the draw, and Limerick, and they beat Cork. Cork 
beginning maybe to, but they just don't seem uh, a great game with Dublin. That was a fantastic kick, all fairness. It was a huge kick. One minute before the semi-final, one minute I'd want Dublin, another minute I'd want Kerry. But at the end of the day, I was saying to myself, Kerry, they're country people like ourselves. And, and, and also it's worth two of you in. It's worth, well, we, we, we'll take, we'll take <laughs> one if we win, it's worth two if we win, yeah. We have good forwards, in fairness, Shane Welsh and uh, Robbie Finnerty and Comer, of course. Comer is flying this year. He has something like 2-9 scored from play in the championship. Um, I think he has 10-44 scored in his championship career. But yes, 10-44. But uh, yeah, and a few more, Paddy Kelly. And, but everyone, the only worry I would have now, and I hope I'm wrong, as I want an All-Ireland, I'm as... I'm, I'm a man in a hurry, I'd love an all Ireland. Is is our bench strong enough? That would be my concern. Yeah. Other than that, I, yeah. but knowing Parik, and I rang Parik last Sunday week after the Dublin Kerry game because I've been good friends with him, and I said, Parik, he said he'd have his team ready, and I believe he'll have them ready. So you have a hotline to the Galway manager. Have you, can you give us any secrets before no, this weekend? No secrets whatsoever. I would, I'd be just a good friend of myself and Parik's dad, Paddy, used to come back here to me. We were always great friends. Uh, first got to know uh, the Joyce. got to know, well, I knew Willie all, Willie all my life, but I knew uh, par, par, the late Parik's dad, Paddy, and it was through colleges. Uh, I have great respect. I love underage football in college. In 1994, in Jarlis won the Hogan Cup and uh, Parik was captain. And ever since that, we men had a great minor team that year. We got to the All Ireland final, but there was a team with a letter K waiting for us. And uh, in fact, I think that Kerry team that beat Galway only got um, about two players that went on to play for the county team. We actually got more out of that minor team in 1994 as I think of it now, than any minor team that ever won an All-Ireland in Galway. We've got eight, seven or eight players out of it. Can I ask then just about some of the specific players of Galway in the, the 50s and 60s? Sean Purcell was maybe a little bit before your time, but you saw a bit of him. I saw a bit of him, yeah. Sean was the end of his, his, his career when I was uh, going out starting the football. Well, in the 60s, of course, I know them. John Keenan and Cyril Dunn, Matty McDonough, Garrett and Rillins in the middle of the field, Christy Tittle, Liam Salmon. I'd be a good friend of Liam. And you had the Donnellans, John and Pat, Noel Tierney, the great fullback, and Johnny Geraghty, all of them in the 60s now were... Yeah. Fi- into Collard and Indian captain is the late Indian. Is is Sean Purcell considered the greatest Galway footballer of all time? Yes, by many, yeah, the greatest footballer of all time. And even by the allegedly Michal Amorahurthy in his book rated yeah. Sean Purcell. And when you have a Kerry man with all the great players that are rating Sean Purcell, he must have been the greatest. What did people say about him? Well, they said he could play in any position. Okay. I think he played in the Connacht semi final in. Chum in 1954 again May on an awful wet day and he played at full back and they put five different players on him they couldn't get past him right full, it's, but in the team of the is century it, there he's listed at 11 yeah. yeah he was always there, but he could play anywhere as they say he could play anywhere Sean Person. right well, did he, and did he play everywhere he, he did really centre field centre, maybe full back definitely full back I don't know whether he played centre back he played full forward centre forward midfield he played colleges with Jarlis in 48, 47. They won the Hogan Cup. He was a midfielder. And Frankie Stockwell and himself had a great understanding. They were known back then as the terrible twins. Stockwell was another midfielder. Stockwell was a full forward. Was a full forward, okay. And Purcell, Purcell um, there was a great story told about the 1957 league final when um, it was level with about five minutes to go with Kerry. And there was a fellow called Ned Roach. He was playing full back for Kerry. And he was marking Purcell and doing a pretty good job on him. But in anyhow, Purcell gets the ball and he goes out towards the sideline, toe to hand, and Ned went with him. And he threw it over his shoulder into the path of Stocky, Frankie, and he stuck it in the net. And that was, that was, that was the, game. the game. And there was the legendary story told about um, Pat Donlan in 63. They claimed down in Kerry that um, Pat Donlan was on his knee hurt a bit but he got up awful quick and scored the goal <laughs> and of course Matty tells the story the late Matty McDonough he tells the story about 
the National Football League, the home final of 65. There was a trip to America at stake. But coming up with about a minute or two to go, Kerry had just taken the lead. A great Kerry player called Bernie O'Callaghan just put Kerry ahead eight points to seven. But Galway come up the field and Matty gets the the goal ball, whether he touched it on the ground, it's hard to know. But into Seamus Laden, a cracking goal and Galway won. But about 40 years later, Matty was playing golf below in, in some part of Kerry. Uh, and this old man was walking along and he said, Matty McDonough from Galway. He said, Matty, you picked the ball off, off, you fouled the ball. I didn't, he said, I, I don't understand golf. I'm playing, a, I don't mean that little ball you're playing out there. He said, you fouled the ball in 65. <laughs> uh, uh, they never forget. That's no. one thing Kerry never forget. Absolutely not. They're still, I think, talking about the famous 82 final. The Seamus Derby goal, so yeah, that'll that'll still be talked about for a long, long time yet. Yeah, that that's so like that's that's really interesting. Like okay, th- then when it comes to like the the nationwide appreciation of those Galway players, like obviously there was huge appreciation within this county. But when it comes to say like the team of the century, the team of the millennium, like the national one, who else other than Purcell makes those teams? Well, on the t- on, on the uh, centenary year, into Colin and Sean Purcell, in date number two, and Sean Purcell at centre forward, and. At the turn of the century, again, the Millennium team, it was the same two players. Same two, okay. Yeah. It's, it's interesting then. It is mad. I didn't realise w- that he played fullback because, like, as you say there, he's at, he's at 11 in your Galway team of the century and obviously I've, I've I've seen very, very little of him. I always had him down as, like, a, a midfielder or a centre forward, but <laughs> he could have been one of the great all-time fullbacks yeah, had he been he played, played there all the time. Fullback, yeah. He played against Mayo and they won the toss and they played... They led 2 3 to a pint at half time, and there was a storm out. A bad July day, we normally don't get an odd one, but they, he still held Mayo out, and they won 2 4 to 1 5. Okay. Our own club man from Carlin Strand here scored a, a goal and two pints that day, Tom McHugh. Yeah, Sean was, he must have been a genius, really. Everyone talks about him. Mm-hmm. And uh, Did you meet? Did you ever get to meet him? Oh, I did, of course. Yeah. Oh, I got to meet him, yeah. What was he like? Ah, oh, he was a. He had always a great word. How's it going, Sham? Well, that's the word they use in Chum. Ah, uh, Sean was a. I did, got to know him very, very, very well. Was he interested in Gaelic games after his playing days? He was, but he was also interested. I remember we were going up one night, to, one night up to a place in Athenry, Jerry Corbett. He has a GEA news team up there, and we brought we brought up. Perth in, right? He's above in Athenry. Oh, this sorry. we went up and. Um, a neighbour, a man over in Corrifin there, Paddy Keaton and myself, and we brought Frank Stockwell and Sean Purcell. But Sean was very interested in looking at, not at the old football we look back, but looking at dog race, and he loved, he loved the greyhounds. Right. Such a greyhound won this, and there was a story told one time in 59 about a greyhound that uh, night for in all Ireland, Sean had a greyhound running in Shelburne Park, and he star bright, and he won. But they reckon Sean brought the Greyhound back down to Chum that night. And the next day was the All-Ireland final. But uh, that's the way it was back then. Okay, so but, he, was, uh, yeah. he travelled up and down from Dublin twice yeah, in the yeah, one weekend. Twice the one weekend, yeah. He was that type of... He was a gentleman. Um, died far too young, I think. But that's... Yeah, I knew Sean. I knew Frankie Stockwell very well. and, and um, the, the dogs was probably one of the reasons that Michal Amara Herty took such a, a warming to Shawnee Purcell as well, because he would have been big into the dogs and his nights at Shelburne. Big in Shelburne. And they went to, to to school, to college together. They were both teachers. That's right. They went to college. And uh, Michal's first commentary, I think, in a match was 1949, in a, which was a very big back then, the Railway Cup. Yeah, yeah, huge. And Purcell was obviously an icon Purcell of the Railway Cup. An icon of the Railway Cup, the same as Christy Ring was with the car, with the Munster hurlers in the Railway Cup. Do you think enough people know about Sean Purcell in, in the modern era? Because he is this legendary figure, kind of like Ring, where a lot of people, we know the name, but none of us have seen enough footage, because there, there isn't enough footage out there. Do you think that in the modern day he's appreciated enough? Well, I suppose it's a different game. I, I'd say an awful lot well, I suppose, in the modern day, wouldn't know of, but um, uh, yeah, he would be very appreciated, certainly in all over Connacht. He'd be appreciated, certainly in the older generation, the younger, it would be very hard to tell. Um, well, there was a story told that grey bearded men back then, there was something wrote in the paper that grey bearded men would tell 
the story of the Terrible Twins, Purcell and Stockwell. We tell their children's children of the Terrible Twins. But it's like telling a young lad today now that idolises Shane Welsh or idolises Dave Clifford uh, about uh, the Bomber Liston or about Mike Sheehy or about Cyril Dunn or Sean Purcell. You know, they, yeah. it's in the times, I suppose. I know this is a difficult question, but if you had to pick one modern footballer that resembled Purcell the most, who would it be? Kieran Kilkenny. Okay, right. Yeah. I think he has. He's related, I think, to Purcell. Yes, actually, yeah. Kieran Kilkenny. I think he's excellent. As is Ber- was that he's retired now. Bernard Brogan, to me, was a classic as well. Kieran Kilkenny, I would reckon on, the, on that. Yeah, Kieran Kilkenny and Tommy Carr, right, are, are descendants of the great Sean Purcell. Yeah, yeah, Tommy Carr. Tommy Carr is married to Sean Purcell's daughter. Yes. And uh, Kieran Kilkenny's father, I think, is first was first cousin to Sean Purcell. Kilkenny's not bad. Oh, Kilkenny. Oh, wish to God we had him on Sunday. <laughs> I would love him. He's super football. And that that's his relation to that uh, Neve Kilkenny that plays with the Galway Camogie Girls. Another team that's filled our heart um, the last couple of years with the Camogie they're playing and I love that game as well the winning two All-Irelands out of three and you can catch that full chat with Leo Courtney across our social channels across this morning OGBM is brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day now this week on the Koi Gig pod Kathleen McNamee and Karen Duggan uh, were all about the Euro 2022 quarterfinals England the first side through to the semis after their extra time victory against Spain last night here's Kathleen and Karen chatting about tonight's showdown that is Germany against Austria the OTB Koi Gig pod here on OTB Sports is in association with Cabri FC they are the official snack partner to the Republic of Ireland's women's national team and after that we will hear more from Owen as he chats to the Galway legend Sean O'Donnell OTB AM This is OTB Sports Radio This summer we're bringing you double Koi gig I thought that that was going to be a much tighter game I cannot tell you the like audible gasps that there were in the press box yesterday they looked as stunned as the team on the pitch did. I thought that they were stronger than that. I thought that they were tactically more aware than that. For the best insight and analysis from this summer's Euros, subscribe to the Koi Gig Pod on the OTB Sports app now. Yeah. Um, so the second quarterfinal is Germany and Austria. So the winners of Spain's group and the runners up of England. Germany have been very strong. I yes. watched them at the weekend. Um, and... They're just so commanding on the ball. They know exactly what they want to do with it. Yeah. Sliding maybe with their goals that they could be scoring a bit more for the shots or the possession that they have. But I can't see them tripping up with Austria. No, neither can I. They're too good defensively. Everything they do has so much purpose. Um, They've come out and really impressed in this tournament. I think Austria... I think they've had a really good run and they've really enjoyed themselves and it's been great to see their kind of press conference antics and the scenes after they beat Norway. I mean, it was wonderful to see. It was, again, one of the highlights, just the underdog coming out and the less said about Norway's contribution to this tournament, the better. But it's great to see a team like Austria break through and they'll have their work cut out against them against Germany. I think uh, Zinsberger will be quite busy um he's, but again if they can frustrate germany for large parts of the game i think that's important um i don't think we'll see austria come out and play too expansively i think we'll see a similar setup to what they did against england where they did press early on um and they tried to put them on the back foot but then they did get deep and start to deny some space so they'll know that the germans are very strong and um very powerful they'll try and slow the game down and just kind of cause as much frustration as possible but I've been so impressed with the Germans um, that... Is there anyone in particular on the German team that has stuck out to you as someone who's having a great tournament? Do you know what I think that they're a real team I find it hard to kind of pick one person um, also I'll be honest I'm not as familiar with a lot of these pairs as I am with some of the English pairs and yeah. it's kind of been a treat to see these pairs I'm like oh where's she playing and to be fair the German league has always been very very strong but it seems to be 
it maybe was in the shadow of the WSL for a while, but now you're seeing Bayern Munich offering big contracts and people start to leave the WSL and maybe go back to Germany. So it shows that there's massive strength there that we probably don't know about. And maybe because of recent results, we overlook Germany a little bit, but safe to say they've been back with a bang in this tournament. OTV Sports in your pocket. Listen to OTB Sports Radio 24-7. Until that habit is broken, do you not realise how crazy those things were? Watch your favourite OTB videos. The benefit of being suspended means scores he wrote every night. Probably not before the game. Read all the latest sports news and opinions. All in one place. The OTB Sports app. Listen, watch, read. Wherever you are, we're always with you. The OTB Sports app. Available to download now from your app store. OTB AM With Gillette Get into your flow With the new Gillette Labs Razor With exfoliating bar Okay, you're very welcome back to our Galway special here on OTB AM We have made it out to Onakaharu Rua And I'm delighted to be joined by Sean O'Donnell Who was of course on the All-Ireland winning teams with Galway in 1998 and 2001 Sean, how are you getting on? Thank you very much, Owen. I'm good this morning, thank you Lovely to see all the bunting coming out here, all the Irish names and the, the Gaelgors and the people from the Gaeltucks getting well supported in this part of the world. Is this a, a real source of pride for those players on the team that are from the Gaeltucks? Well, I suppose we've got to think we're so proud of Sean Kelly um, because he's the captain of the team from McCullen who would be in the Gaeltucks here. We have, then you came through Spiddled in on the way out of Fintan O'Leary. So we're good. We're, we're very happy because we, the, I suppose the Gaeltucks and the Gaelgory would have a prong, strong, I suppose, uh, tradition with the Galway teams, the winning teams going back over the years. So we're very proud of them and um, what they've achieved today because it wasn't easy. It's been a long time waiting like since we're 2001. Like, so it's a long time coming. From your own team, it was yourself and Sean Oak that represented the Gaeltucks. Was there, was there a few others as well? Oh, there was four actually. I suppose Pat Comer was okay. playing for Incaro at that time. Kevin Terry, Matt Dunlucha. Then you had a guy, Michael Gagan from some more then you had I suppose the Clannan boys the Spill Lads it was a, there was a good gang actually I think all together about 15-16 from the West on that team so it was a strong great thought there was a lot of Irish in that team at that moment in, in time so it was good um, I should probably have uh, done this interview in Irish and I'm just incompetent uh, and uh, I feel doing it a disservice here because when you're driving around uh, it's Irish college season as well which is just a, a strange experience for those kids I'd imagine being here in the middle of uh, an All-Ireland final week which obviously is never the case Well that's, as you said and it's um, actually the building we're in at the moment has got Kalosh to Kieran who's actually owned by the father of Sean Logue right. so so um, it's, it's wonderful to say we have over 300 students here and a lot of great footballers came through the door here like I think we were mentioning earlier like Michael Darren McCauley has been here uh, Kieran Kilkenny Chaffis Patrick played for Kilkenny so these ones are all student teachers would have come through the door here so you never know the next generation is probably in at the moment from all around the country what did the likes of Macaulay and Fitzpatrick and Kilkenny get out of their experience down here when, when they've popped down? I suppose you have to wait for their books, like you know what I mean, like that. So it would be rude to say anything like I mean, because I suppose that learning the Irish, which is important, but there is a kind of a, a social side to it regarding the culture and the language. And I suppose the pubs have a large sign it too. But you know, they were to my knowledge, they were good and they looked after themselves and they behaved. So that's the most important thing. Is there uh, not a divide, but is there kind of like an extra sense of pride about people from this part of the county compared to maybe some of the, the city lads? Is there kind of like a, a country town divide like there is in most counties here? There is, I suppose. The Gweltoft would be seen, I suppose, a different part. Like, you know, I suppose we're no different to other parts of the country but the language. So that's what we see ourselves different. We take pride in it and we understand the value of it, which is very important to myself. I'm dealing with it every day. So it's kind of a scenario where we, we understand it, where it's come from and we kind of, I suppose, we deal with the Gweltoft. We have a competition here yearly, which is called the Comorsa Spell the Gweltoft, where all the clubs in the Gweltoft would be playing each other on a yearly thing in an all Ireland competition. So you get to understand and see and acknowledge and kind of befriend other county players, other county teams. So it, it's a strong relationship, which probably other clubs wouldn't have that we have, which is very important to us and we kind of value it. And you'd have that connection, obviously, with the, the likes of the lads in, in West Kerry as well. Obviously, they'd pop up for that for that competition. We do, and we pop down there. Like, I mean, it's, I always go back to like the times we played the Gothel teams. Like, there was a huge, strong the Kerry. I mean, there was huge, strong Gothel times that time. And myself and Sean Ogdupuir would be kind of speaking Irish all the time when we were playing. You does you use this kind of as tactical because a lot of the players we were playing didn't have any Irish. So you'd be able to say in Irish if the ball was being kicked out, like oh, Thief Clay and the Jadesh, Fan and Fan stay up, stay down, go sideways. But then it was strange that Gothel boys are doing the same in Kerry. 
So when we played each other then, we were kind of speaking ours, we were looking at each other and saying, what's the point? These guys know it as well. But we continued on. And it's funny, all our conversations would be still in Irish and afterwards. So it's, it's nice. And I suppose it's a way of keeping the thing going alive, which is good. Right. So yourself and Darrow O'Shea had no advantage over one another when he came head to head in 2000, for example. Well, that was it. And actually, Irish would be what well, we'd speak to each other like. You know, I suppose when we were flaking each other in the middle of the pitch that time, the cursing was done in Irish and that's how it was. But there was no advantage. And we knew that. And it was kind of strange because it took us a few seconds to kind of acknowledge it. Actually, there's no point speaking Irish because they understand us anyway. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll get to that 2000 game uh, in a moment because it obviously has great parallels with this year. But I'm just more interested, first of all, in, in 98 because there was just this brilliant ability where maybe your neighbours in, in Mayo had come so close a couple of years earlier and Galway kind of came and won it at the, the first time of asking in, in 1998. There could be a very similar story this weekend if Galway are to get over the line. Well, there's huge similarities you think about. Like, like we were always watching Mayo from 96 and 97 going to our finals. I mean, so close. And we knew a lot of those players. And I suppose the old time, it was, it was knockout competitions. So we used to have early summers, you know, that time. So we knew that. And when Jono came in then in 98, being a Mayo man and I suppose the experience, the whole culture of the county team changed. I suppose we know it and we take it for granted now, professionalism and how it is. But we probably started that time regarding sports psychology, dietitian video analysis even though the, probably the younger generation don't have a clue what a VHS tape is but we had Larry Gorman from RTE doing video, video analysis for us that time of the other teams but it, it changed the whole mentality of the team at the time I suppose another thing too like every county and probably club team there was a bit of politics on what club or what college John came in with a clean slate it didn't give a difference if you were a junior or where you went or school or what stories you were picked on your football ability and your things so we had a strong team there and um, he, he, I suppose the result was at the time is we played a Mayo team that were probably favourites again in 98 when we had to go to Castle Bar. And, but we went up there as pure underdogs, but went up there with huge kind of, I suppose, confidence and credit. We knew we could beat them. We knew we had the players to beat them. We knew we were as good as them. And if we showed it the year before, in, I suppose, in 97, when they bet us in Toom, that we weren't far off it. And I suppose that's, I go back even the year before that, when they bet us a real hot day in Toom Stadium, that we, we were, again, we didn't start well, but we should have won it. Maybe a few mistakes and a bit more probably experience would have won it for us. But uh, we knew then we were as good as them. When you see a team then get into a final, you kind of say, you know what, I'm, we're not far off it. And I suppose that people didn't understand that. You kind of, your own credibility is kind of building at that stage. But then in 98, it's funny as we look in coex of this year, we played Mayo in the first round championship. We played Leitrim. We played Roscommon. Then we played Derry. So it's kind of the same trend going on, nearly the same results. So... Uh, Hopefully, the only difference is Kerry got beaten by Kildare in the semi-final, yes. so we played Kildare. So hopefully that this trend continues on. And we're, we're going to a good place too because the expectations in the county wouldn't be huge. And I'm not putting in a negative way that we don't, uh, we don't have confidence in our team, but we know that, like I suppose, we look at our neighbours and every year saying, we're going to win it, we're going to win the all Ireland. So we know we're against a very good, strong Kerry team with big, with big experience, big players, probably one of the best forwards in the country or ever in in Clifford and we look at the t management team of O'Connor who's got serious experience so we know to win this game we have to be at our best but then in all our learns you have to be at your best to win them That's really interesting the sort of using Mayo as a benchmark in, in 98 that you saw a team come close the previous two years we can beat them, therefore we can come at the very worst close to winning in All-Ireland. Do you think that that's a, a real piece of psychology that, that they would be using this year, for example? Of course, like when, like you can think Mayo got beaten in the final again last year against Tyrone. Galway played them first round, having been beaten a few, two, three years before that, beaten them. Same as Roscommon, then the kind of final, having lost twice in the league, beaten them again. Then you're going up against, against a team like Armagh, different mentality, different physicality, um, then beating them in extra time and on penalties, which was a huge mental thing. Like So I always remember like the kind of scenarios of this, that that game actually made the Galway team, the Armagh game. I always look at that game when, when was it, six, seven points up going into injury time. We, we kind of, you might as well say, won't, we blew it, simple as that. Like, and I mean, that game should have been buried. And probably a bit of a trend that was going with Galway up to that game. Mayo were well ahead last minutes of the game, let them back in, same as Common. Then we did it against Armagh. But we call it the handbags on the sideline. We don't call those. And any of the lads that played in the older years, in the 90s and noughties, we don't call them ruckus. They weren't fights at all, like, you know. But the two lads that got caught, I suppose they got what was coming to them and, and they learned from that. You know I mean? There are two young lads uh, like the, the, the Armagh lad and the Goa lad. So they learned from that and they're getting the punishment for it. But um, the thing about it was Goa were going in that time with the heads down and when that happened it kind of I suppose it put a bit of air back into their chest and the chest went out. So that actually, if anything, it actually helped Goa more than Armagh and it was seen in the extra time and the penalties. But going on to that, like we have... Um, 
we were saying there, the mentality of the, the supporters are kind of, we're not over expecting to win the game, which is good. And you can probably see we haven't gone crazy in the bunting and all that stuff and the, and the tyres on the, on the side of the road and there's no talk of any homecoming and all that stuff and pitches and places being ready and booked. But that's the way we always were in Galway. And the same in Kerry. You know, we'll celebrate when we win. But we'll also celebrate the team that loses as well because we know the work they've put in and they deserve that. Yeah, uh, absolutely. It's, it's interesting as well, actually, talk about Galway uh, potentially blowing it against Armagh. You've maybe got two teams who blew it at various stages in, in the path so far, so it's really interesting uh, on a psychological level. And, and when you talk about psychology there, just to go back to 98 again, you mentioned John O'Mahony maybe bringing those sort of things into, into proceedings in, in 98. We've all seen the documentary. We've seen A Year Till Sunday. One of my favourite pieces of psychology is the newspaper uh, being held up. I mean, just, fancy dance. Yeah, uh, the fancy dance, exactly. What other bits didn't we see in the documentary that, that, that tapped into your psychology? People understand there was 200 hours of video done. We always wanted the uncut version of Pat PC and there's talk of a new one, take two. So that'd be interesting to see what's it like after 20, like you might as well 24 years. You should wait till 25 years next year. We'll do our homecoming, as I say. But the thing about that at the time was um, at the start, I suppose, I wouldn't say we were comfortable with it at the time. And you see the first videos that were hidden behind uh, uh, sports bags and corners and under behind water bottles. But then as we got to the kind of final and after, it was just... PC with a camera right. and don't forget Pat was playing at the time he was, he was, he was a sub keeper at the time and so it was hard for him now it's maybe it's a bit easier as he's, he's, a, he's, a, he's a coach now with Galway with under PC like under Port Joyce so but the thing about it was and I think that's what made it so valuable um, he was able to do it and to see the, I know a lot of teams tried it before but never actually got to the Holy Grail. And I suppose for people, as you said, the sports psychology, a lot of supporters still do think we just go training and that's it and we show up at the day of the match and there's no more about it. There's a huge amount of work and it's changing every year. And the amount of, they're, you might as well say they're pure professionals like that. There's no difference than a GA player today, county GA player as a soccer premiership player. They have to do the same commitments, uh, which is kind of a scenario, same sacrifices, you might say. They're not even commitments, they're sacrifices, bring family, work, everything. And then we only see one team win. And we forget the teams that fall. There's no difference, and I'm not picking Leitrim as a bad team, but those players put in the same uh, sacrifices as the team like of Dublin players were doing. But the thing about it is just to be the team with the better players or the better background or the better financial thing. So regarding the year till Sunday, I suppose it showed behind what was going on. And it wasn't all pretty, and it shows that, like, you see arguments, you see players, and I got a bit of a stick in that video too, like, and that's what it was. But it also shows us going, what you do before the match, going up in the trains, like, people didn't see parts where Jano brought us up to Crow Park before the semi-final. We're at the all Ireland semi-final hurling. And the reason being is a lot of us never saw Crow Park, the new Crow Park at the time, the dressing rooms and the, the, the warm-up pitch and what he was trying to do, which again, which is sports psychology, the mental side of it, the sound side of it. So when we arrived at Crow Park for the semi-final to play Derry, we weren't in awe of the stadium. We were here last week, he saw it. Right. We were brought up to the hurling all Ireland final. We were there, and I always remember this from Jano, and this is something I always I remember is the game was over, Kilkenny were after being beaten by Offaly, the famous Offaly Kilkenny final in 98. And we're all ready to go, and John said, Stop. We're, I think we're on the Hogan, Upper Hogan at the time, and he said, Stop. And where would it look? And he pointed over where the Kilkenny boys were, the further on the Cusick side. And he looked, and the downstairs, you could see the Offaly boys celebrating with the McCarthy Cup. And he remember looking to us and said, Where do you want to be in two weeks' time, on that side or below? And it's, again, it's a mental picture. And these things do stand to you then when you're, when you're playing, when, when the, you say when you hit the wall and you, kind of, you start thinking this, where do I want to be? Do I want to be the winning side of it or do I want to be the losing side of it? So he was very shrewd, smart, teacher-like way, but he was before his time and the stuff like he, you never went on the pitch unprepared. Like regarding his work or education, he was always there asking the questions, are you all right? Um, he brought in a sports psychologist. We thought he was mad, like, you know what I mean? I suppose the sports I thought we were mad as well. But there were the stories that happened. I remember I had a meeting with a sports car, I remember when I was working and John said, do you want to, do you want to meet Bill? And I was saying, why do you need Bill? I'm too busy, I'm working and all this stuff. And he says, no harm, Sean, to meet him. And I was saying, why? And then I was thinking, was there something wrong with me then that he wanted me, to, you know what I mean, like this, where they're taking it for granted now. And I remember we met in a, in a hotel there, Connemara Coast, and we are just having a chat over a cup of coffee and I was kind of thinking, listen, I'm too busy for this, like, what's the story? And, and what came back was, I suppose, my preparation for games was, I used to laugh and joke. And that was me kind of, you know what I mean? That was my way of handling nerves. It would be just being kind of joking around in the dressing room and like that. And I suppose that those other lads then weren't liking me joking around where they're trying to be serious. So 
I suppose the, 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 the deal we got was I had to go into the shower before matches just mess around. Okay. So the other guys, so that was, that's your sort of sports psychology in the 90s, like, you know? Okay, so he divided the, the messers from the serious men. Well, I suppose we're all serious, but I suppose yeah. it's, we all tackle stress in different ways. Sure. And that's the way, we're, if we're all the same, in a boring world. And I suppose that was my way of doing it and a few other lads where other guys used to get sick, other guys used to be, have their, you know I mean, walking up and down, pacing, other ones would lay out the clothes. And that's what makes us a different team. But the thing about it, we all had the same goal and wanted the same ambition. And that's what makes it, made it a good football team at the time. That's a really interesting one about Jono bringing you to Crow Park beforehand. So, like, do you actually get down to the dressing rooms even when the hurling final, semi-finals and final are on just to get a look around what's underneath the stadium as well? It was afterwards. We went in afterwards. So it was just, it was strange because, like, I know the lads, some of the lads were there in 95 when they got to the semi-final, but it was a new team. It was an underage team as well. Like, that was the Park and those. So it was the new Crow Park dressing rooms at the time with the new warm-up area. So it was great to walk around and see the stadium and see the pitch. And the most important thing, which was really is the dressing rooms. So you're looking around and maybe now, as I say, the new teams, it's, it's nothing new to them, but to us it was new. And um, the atmosphere too of a semi-final, the atmosphere of a final. You don't understand the sound, people like, I mean, yes, we've all been in the stadium, but on the pitch, it's a different echo, it's a different sound. And the thing about it is the visual side of it. And that's why I thought always, and to this day, it still stands me seeing the Kilkenny teams with the head down on the far side of the pitch and their, their hands folded over and looking at the Offaly captain receiving the McCarthy Cup. And it always stands to me regarding, you know what, I know what side I want to be on. And it makes you, it might only be a half a percent, you work harder, but that's the difference. If 15 guys do that half a percent, it's the difference of winning and losing a match. If you could fast forward a little bit then, and it's not going to be a factor that will be anywhere near the minds of the players this weekend, but having been champions in 1998, how important was it for your own sense of legacy to win a second one? Well, I suppose the, the killer and the, and, and the kick in the teeth to us was 99, because yeah. we had a good team. We knew we were good enough there. And I suppose it was 32 years of heartache and we celebrated and we did celebrate. But the problem that time, the league started again in October. So we didn't have much time to celebrate, but it was kind of, we didn't even have, have a, a team holiday because we didn't, this shows you how unprepared we were. It was like, we got vouchers to go individually, but we never went on a team holiday in 98. Right. So because we didn't expect it, it wasn't one of those things to do. But, uh, and you're back in it again. But in 99 when Mayo bet us, that was hard. That really, really hard. It hit kind of a, a sore bone with us as a team. There was a lot of changes to the panel as well in between 98 and 99. A lot of the young lads were brought in from Corrafane. So it was kind of a rebuild to a certain T. Um, but it was hurt. It was very hurtful and the snare was there. So when we got beaten by Mayo and then again, typical Mayo doing what they do best, going so far and just falling at the last hurdle. So, uh, 2000 was a different one for us. We knew then we... It, it was always said, and it's still said today, a good team wins in our, in our line, a great team wins two. And don't forget, we look, we, we take it for granted now, Dublin being in our final and winning five, six finals. And, but that time, no team had done two in a row. So it shows you since the great Cork team of the 90s. So it was, it was unheard of, really, at that stage. So we knew we had to win another one. So in 2000, I suppose, it was kind of back to the drawing board. We weren't all our winners, fight, uh, sorry, champions anymore. We were just another, another kind of a team trying to win it. So we, again, after 2000, I suppose, we look at it, I think we played, I think that's the game we played Sligo and we kept them scoreless for a whole half, which is unheard of in today's championship. Like we, I think it was 16 points to no score at half time. We played Leitrim in the kind of final. I think Leitrim only got one point in injury time. So we were a team with a mission. You know what I mean? We weren't taking any prisoners. A bit like the Dublin team. You know the way we kept the foot on the throat. We just kept going. But then um, we had, I remember it was a hard game. I think the semi-final against um, Kildare. I remember that time it was a kind of a wet day in Kildare. Again, Kildare, fans really hated Galway like the Derry guys yeah. we just were their bogey team came up against a good team and they had a good team but I remember the Kerry game was Kerry again typical you kind of it's an old scenario you really aren't great champions you beat Kerry and I suppose you can say where Limerick last week too with the hurling they had to beat Kilkenny sure. and I suppose for us that time we knew we were good enough we were going in kind of a bit as an underdog as well because this was a serious Kerry team with some serious stars and I suppose we look at the first game was, I think we started very badly. Uh, Kevin was injured at the time, who was a huge loss to myself in midfield as well because the experience that he brought like, in, his, in, his, in his wise old head as well. He taught that himself anyway, but we say that to him anyway. But again, huge experience on the day. So we get them, I think, for eight points down at half time or something like that. But um, Kevin then came on the second half and um, it was a different game. And I always remember to the dying five, six minutes, we had them. Yeah. They were beaten. I remember... Like, I'm not saying this in a derogatory way about Daryl Shea because uh, a warrior and a leader, but you could see in his eyes and the body language, they were, he was, they were beaten. Yeah. 
they just wanted to be put out of their misery. We were there and think, I think Sean O'Toole had a chance. And I always remember Derek Savage going for a shot on Porrick inside. And if he only passed it, Porrick would have buried it. Sean missing another one. We had three or four chances there to win the game. And you know, if you got that, just that extra one to go ahead, we would have won the match. And I suppose from us was from coming from a kind of a bit like we're looking at the Orget Mag game. We came from behind to draw it. We were kind of happy. Yes. Where Kerry knew they came back, they had another second chance and we didn't learn. And I always look at that in the replay, we didn't learn. And um, even though Declan Mean got an unbelievable goal and Morris Fitz, like, and, I mean, an honour from likes of me to play on a pitch. Like, people don't understand, we talk about the great players now of the, of the Cleveland Clippers. Morris Fitz was an absolute genius. He was a magician with the football. Like, I mean, he's not many players you could say that could play in goal and play corner back and play also corner forward. He was just, he was unbelievable and, and respect him for that ever, like, and a gentleman on and off the pitch. But um, we just didn't learn. And it's not a, not in kind of a um, quality or defect to the management or the players, just that uh, they just wanted a bit more on the day. And that's what happened to us in the, in the replay. So it was a hard one because it, it hadn't been a long time. I always remember the first game going to, the, I think it was the City West we went to. Or it's a weird thing sitting down and you just want to go home. Yeah. You don't want a dinner. You don't want to talk. You just want to go home and just get back on, back on the pitch again. And you're there going through the whole motions of a, an after dinner of a defeat or something like that. So it was hard because we had two weeks of a draw and a defeat dinner. And it didn't, and I think all those things stood to us in 2001, where we knew we just didn't want to taste it, that defeat again. And you'll always hear players saying, "You need to lose one to win one." I don't believe that. No, because no. I was going to ask, like those 2001 happen if you don't lose 2000. I always say, if we'd won 2000, we probably wouldn't have won 2001. It would be one. I just, I don't know why. I just one of those things. But I don't believe in that. You hear these teams, you need to lose one. Look at Mayo; they've lost enough. They haven't won one. So how many do you have to lose? And um, so we look at a scenario where. If you can win it, win it. Because you don't know, like, who would have thought after 2001 that it would take 20, 21 years again to get back again. And, and we were 32 years having won it before. And it just, like, Dublin mightn't be in an all Ireland final for a long time to come again. And so when you're there, take full advantage of it. That's a really interesting juncture in football as well, that 2000 final. Uh, this 2001 final probably more accurately because it's the, the last one before Ulster have this huge revolution and it, it changes the game really. And it kind of feels like even the Kerry team that wins in 2004 is very different to the 2000 team. I know it's not just a lot of similar players, but it feels like a different era of football. What was your experience as a player post-2001 when our man Tyrone started to dominate? I suppose the thing about them, we love playing the Northern Boys. The Northern Boys brought a bit of kind of hardness, a bit of steel to games. And I suppose the Galway team at the time, we had a very strong spine. Like you had players like Thomas Mannion, like I mean, was hard of steel himself, Kevin, you had Gary Fahey, you had Dibley. You had players, we loved the kind of the physicality. I used to love, I remember that time in 2000 and 2001 playing Armagh. And I'm not saying this, but they thought they were tough and hard. And they brought that because it was in their mental kind of a DNA. But then when they when they met Steel with Steel, they didn't like it at all. And I suppose we used to kind of love it then because, come on, bring it on like this. Where I suppose then when they played the, the Kerry teams and all that stuff where they brought this kind of, as say, mass defence and area like that, it suited them. Because then, like, you have the likes of the Kerry forwards who were unbelievable forwards, but they didn't like to be pushed around. And I suppose that was a problem with Galway. And going back even to 2000, we played Kerry playing football. And maybe that was a mistake we did. We went, as we fought fire with fire and it doesn't work. Where sometimes you have to bring a different game and maybe that was a problem. We didn't have a plan B. And sometimes you do have to see what other teams' weaknesses are and what their strengths are and go for their weaknesses instead of going, going for your own strengths. And maybe I always look at that. Maybe we, were, we played Kerry playing football. And I know a lot of people now are looking at even at this weekend um, like I mean, we have, they're both the same in two footballing counties, and it won't be so pretty. Trust me on that. But going back to your question on the Northern Boys, it was just the mentality, and I suppose you, it was a golden era of uh, Ulster football, but it was a golden era of hard football, you know, in that kind of way. And that's what probably where the Galways, we were kind of um, a lot of us had retired at the stage. The Mayo Boys were coming out. We there wasn't a strong time there. Kerry was in the same boat. You know, what I mean, the Ulster, Leinster had totally disappeared at that stage, and uh, it was just there was so any team that came out of Ulster. They were black and blue, but they knew how to win. I'm not going to say ugly, but they knew how to win not the nice way. Yeah. And that's what happened, and that's why they were so successful. You mentioned the retirements there. Other than that, what did happen to Galway in the 2000s? Well, I suppose it's like every team. And like, like you mean, it happened to Kerry and so that. It was just a scenario where we had such success. Like People forget like we, we all played in four All-Irons, two league finals. Um, we, were, we were just a good team at the right time. But what made that team was it was a mixture of old and young. You had players, and I won't call them old, but like you had the Kevins, you had the Thomas Mannions and these players and Mac and Gold. And I suppose Sean Ogan, well, you had these guys who were really at their peak 
at the time of of, um, of their playing career. And you had these great, uh, absolute whiz kids. Of you had the likes of as, as we call them, Michael Donnell, Park Joyce, Paul Clancy, Derek Savage. Like I mean, unbelievable footballers. Like you know, and Thomas Meehan, Declan Meehan. Like and then you all of a sudden you had this just perfect mix, and that's it. You had experience, youth, speed, strength, everything. And then all of a sudden, like everything else, it's hard. I mean, then you, it's not like today, the careers, the families, and all this comes in, and the same old slog. Like, I mean, people are saying, Gaw is a big county. Like I, used to, like, I used to leave my work here at half four in the afternoon to be training in Banlaslow at half seven. Three hours. And then you'd be leaving there half ten, home at one o'clock in the morning. So people understand that's a hard slog. There was no motorways that time. You'd grab a few sandwiches and a carton of milk, and you go home. So and that's... Poor me. But that's what it was. You always so, train in Ballon Slow. We used to train once a week coming up to the championship because the boys in Dublin. Oh, we used to train okay. in Monave, but Monave is still another 50k from here across the city. So um, then Tume. So you got people to stand. Always a large, large county. Like, And you're talking for me, the average was always an hour and a half traveling there. So three hours traveling just to a training session. Mm. So it's tough. Is that, um, we'll come back to that in just a sec, but is that, is that something that has gone in their favour recently. I've, I've no idea now. We're like a lot of the Galway lads based in Dublin pre-COVID and has things changed? Because I know Mayo commented on that um, when COVID arrived that um, when they got to the couple of All-Irelands during COVID it was like it's great to not have to tra- train in the middle of the country somewhere. Yeah, has that been a factor at all for Galway? I don't think so because the majority of them would be based around the city around Galway and students. And if you look at the majority of all county teams they're more the school teachers or their yeah. students or reps or something like that. So their kind of lifestyle is based around football. And you can see that, and you, there's, no, there's no other way. If you have a nine to five job, it's, it's, you, it's serious sacrifice. Like, and you look at McCarthy, like, and you know, these guys, and McCaffrey, sorry, as a doctor, it's impossible. You know what I mean? It's impossible to have anything else. You cannot, you cannot keep both sides going because something's going to break in the end. So we're lucky enough that I know your students up in, in Dublin as well, and a few around the county, but these guys train with their, with their colleges. You know what I mean? They're with the Sigurds and stuff like that. And they're, they're, they're just primed athletes, like that scenario. So they're well looked after. The motorways make it a bit easier. Yeah. Like from Dublin to Galway, you'd be out in an hour and a half. Don't forget, I was doing that as well nearly every night. So it's, it suits them. So it wouldn't be a huge factor. I suppose what the COVID was, everybody was working from home and that kind of scenario. But that was another animal, which is, is I mean, I'm glad it's over because um, it was tough. It was serious hard playing without no, anyone watching you and stuff like that. It was tough and, and pods and all that stuff. So hope we don't have to go back there again. Just one last thing I wanted to touch on from that 2000s conversation we were having is, I guess it kind of fits into the bit we were talking about with regards to Armagh and Tyrone. And Galway eventually do turn to an Armagh man to try and uh, ch- change their fortunes around in, in Joe Kernan in 2010. You were in his backroom team at that point. Can you talk us through how that happened and, and uh, why it was Joe in the first place and, and your own experiences that year? Well, I suppose people understand Joe's mom is a Galway woman. She was from Banaslow, like, and Joe always said that he would never, ever manage another team but Galway. So I suppose uh, with Galway that time again, it was a hard time because um, it was a rebuilding team, and I always remember um, in that championship because Joe, again, to me, was probably the modern era manager. He had a great coach in John McCluskey who was over with Bath, English rugby league team, and brought him over. And it was the first time I actually probably saw the modern day training uh, where the manager really stood back at the trainer. So that's what he does. He's, instead of a manager trying to change, I always look at a scenario trying to make racehorses out of elephants. You had, you know what I mean? You, do, you work with what you have. Don't try and change the DNA. So what are your strengths and work on that? And we had a very good team that time, a very young team, with, but probably not experienced at the time, probably had a bit of heartache and some of that. But with good man's I remember Adam Mulholland was before it and Liam Salmon, and there was a good structure done that time. And I suppose when Joe was brought in, it was kind of bringing an outside voice, an outside view. And myself and Tom Nocton were brought in as selectors. And it, it didn't work out in the end. We only did the one year, but um, we're unlucky too, because I always remember we played, actually, and Kevin was the manager of Sligo, and Sligo bet us, I think, in, in, the, in the Connacht semi-final that time. But I remember losing Thomas, uh, sorry, Michael Meehan and Nicky Joyce, who would be a first cousin to work, who were probably one of the two best forwards in the time. We didn't have them. And they'd be like losing today um, Sean O'Shea and, and, and Clifford in a game. So we were unlucky that time. I knew that. Um, but it's one of those things, you just, it's experience. But uh, I saw, uh, I suppose, it stood me regarding my own management career, regarding local t- county teams and underage here in my own club. I learned a lot and a lot of how to kind of manage teams and drills and stuff like that. And it's um, the, the modern player and how you have to live and regarding sports psychology and dietitians and video analysis and all that stuff. So it was interesting and I learned a lot. Yeah, like if your All-Ireland winning years were right before revolution, so was 
that time in 2010, right before the Dublin yeah. Revolution. So you were kind of at the centre of two really important junctures in modern Gaelic football. Correct. But I suppose I, I went from, I suppose, you might as well say I went from the black and white to the colour to the, as I say, to the modern, as I say, digital TVs, the HDs. So, but it's, it's an interesting one because we, at the end of the day, the players are still the same. The same skills as what you're, what you're trying to do with them is actually get the max out of them. And I suppose when you look back to the years, I always even myself, maybe I should have done a bit more. Maybe I should have looked after myself a bit more. Maybe I should have done A, B. Because we'll always look back when we used to do weights in the winter. And then you'd stop. That was it. You stopped the minute of the championship. You never did any more. Where now it's all about core and stuff like that. And looking after yourself and the right food and the right energy and the right sleep and this. And when you go on the pitch, you can see them. They're, they're, they're primed. They're like racehorses. They're primed animals. And you never see them come off. And the GPSs, that, like I remember Joe's, the one, that was 2010, brought in the GPSs where you learned regarding, you see a guy on the pitch where you think like, the sweat's pouring out of him and, Jesus, that guy, he can't run anymore. But the G- GPS says, that guy's nothing wrong. His heart is perfect. And then you see a guy there, you think he'd keep running and his heart is at full whack, you know, that kind of way. So you learn a lot where digital kind of technology is coming ahead now and you're using it and it's used correctly and that's what it's, and it's, and it's important. But then you kind of say, are we losing the fun aspect of sport regarding uh, the GA itself, where now, yes, county t- planes have to train at that, but then you see the underage and you see these development squads and then you see the clubs, it's going down, it's going down, thinking, we need to do this too. So you, you hear now, you see teams under 14s wearing GPSs. So like, you mean, where, what, is, is the Gwilin would say, care they in point? Like, you know, that's the way I look at it. Like, are we not kind of, um, that's why probably why I always say is we lose so many great young underage talent by the time they're 18, 19, because they're burnt out. Yeah. They've been over analyzed, over trained, over everything where they just say, I don't want to do it anymore. And it's, it's a shame, it's a pity, and it needs to be looked at. And it's, it's happening too often. And maybe it's something GA really has to look at properly. Is that your experience in this part of Galway that maybe the, 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 it's not being squeezed to the full of its potential, the, the, the kids that are growing up around here? It, 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 I'm not saying squeeze. It's, I think it's as far as uh, you go to any local pub around the country, they'll tell you that. They'll just say, listen, you just put a gun Gee, that guy was an unbelievable talent. Yeah. And that's the problem. You, the question is, why do you not continue on? Why aren't they going on to the next level? Why aren't they representing their county? And listen, only a small percentage can. It's not a scenario that you don't want to represent your county. Maybe physically you can't because of work commitments, family commitments, travel commitments. So people have to forget that. But there is a lot of them you kind of say, and Galway had, were renowned for that. We had some great underage teams over the last 20 years. And you looked in at teams saying, Jesus, you look at a minor team, there's only two in that team ever went on and played senior. But you look at the team today, nearly all played under 21 minor. And so that's really where you want to see that they're coming on. The Northern boys were great at that. Tyrone were brilliant at that where they brought them forward. And I suppose they looked at a minor medal, really, not, not knocking a county All-Ireland minor medal, but it didn't really count unless you went played senior. And I think that's the way they're looked at. And maybe we give too much value to a minor medal. And that was, the, I'm not saying it, it's, it's a huge commitment and a huge uh, achievement to win a, an, an Ireland medal, minor medal. But maybe we say is you can do more. And that's the thing about it. You're still coaching away a bit, are you? Still coaching away now, but I'm coming to the end of my coaching. I suppose I'm 20 years on the coaching uh, trail. And um, I suppose, like everything else, I have two young lads coming through. And I suppose you follow them. I suppose the kind of scenario, like you go there saying, I'll give a hand. Uh, hand out a few water bottles because you're dropping them off at training and you're picking them up and going to the matches and end up you end up start coaching next thing your manager and all that stuff but I enjoyed it I think it's very important nearly every county player should do it or ex-county player that to give a little bit back you know because especially your own club because it's important because it's very important to give the knowledge you have and I'm not saying it's valuable knowledge but anything you learn I think is valuable in coaching because I think we've gone away from speaking and coaching players I think we we too much emphasis on the drills of that where like we're not speaking to them telling you you spot things like I, I, I don't enjoy matches anymore I actually analyse matches which I kind of find it's annoying because um, I don't enjoy it I'll be watching looking at tactics looking where the players are moving that I just don't watch the scores anymore I'll say why did that score happen so um, but it's still it's still the, the the GA, the football GA is still in my heart so big, like, and I love it. And uh, that's why I think it's so important to us to enjoy it. And uh, I say for ex-players, anyone, and again, the people that give their free time to coach, and that's the most important thing, it's so important. But for Galway, and I suppose this is it, um, it's always important to have a senior team doing well. Mm-hmm. Because when they do, the younger agents see it, and they go to Crow Park and they enjoy it. And that really makes our job as coaches and underage and, and, and the senior teams easier because they want to come out training. They want to play football. 
when the team isn't doing well, they don't want to. They'll watch the soccer, they'll watch other sports, rugby, which is great. And it's very important that all children play sports. But as us, as the, the GA and the, and the Gaelic football, we want them doing our sport more than others. And um, when Galway are doing well and getting to finals, it makes it easier for us. Did you always know that Joyce was going to be the guy that would take Galway pretty close? Not an iota. I thought you, if you were asking me, he'd be one of the last. And, and, and this is not knocking him in any way. Uh, Porrick and like unbelievable player like you know, and funny he was with us in 2010 and I, I have no problem saying this and we had this conversation we saw him as ah, he's going to be a player that's coming on in the second half as a sub he was our standout player and he's funny he was like a, he was like a, a great bottle of wine a glass of wine he improved with age like we, we all, I, I saw Porrick training like I mean he's a magician like I mean we used to have three on one backs and, and one forward and he'd have the three backs and the goalkeeper sitting on their arse and he'd be still throwing the ball like you know but Porrick uh, he's a typical North Board footballer guy like uh, uh, cocky in one way, and I'm not saying this again in, in, in any kind of disrespect to Park, and you have to be, to be a great player, you have to have a, a bit of cockiness in you, because if you don't, you know what I mean, you'll never be that good, like, and I'm not saying you're showing it, but mentally you have to have it. But he wouldn't have been one, like, in all fairness, there's other guys I would put before him, but I suppose um, the business that he's in now, and, 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 and what I call it, he's in recruitment agency, so I suppose when you're in business, understand the kind of the, the how do you say, the quick the business line and all that stuff, so he's like he didn't have much experience, people forget. Like he had the under twenty team there, and only got like he didn't didn't achieve anything there, but came in. But the most important thing about Park does, that's what a good manager does. He gets a great team around him. Like we have a local guy here, Milo Milo Don, who was a captain of the Carroll Club. We won our only in one county championship in '96, and then you have then the likes of Ken O'Neill. Like Ken O'Neill is a genius. Um, he himself and Buckley and these guys, you know, what I mean, they're absolute genius. And they were, we go back about the the importance of trainers. And maybe that's what probably Park was probably lacking in the last couple of years that he probably tried to do it all himself. And um, bringing in Kinnery was an absolute smart um, genius of an idea, a valuable idea. And you can see the difference. This is a guy that was with Tipperary, Kerry, Mayo, manager of Kildare, known at all. Now he's brought that huge wealth of experience and, and bringing it to a team. And you can see it. They're, they're, the boys are enjoying their football and they're playing at their absolute limits. And that's what you want to see. Um, there's going to be a lot of different uh, previews done in terms of different matchups to go on this weekend. I'm just very keen to get your take on how midfield goes th- this weekend because uh, I think you could kind of maybe call it either way. There's been a, plenty of criticism of the, the Kerry midfield and then similarly there's been people picking up the Kerry midfield saying that they have the, the edge over the Galway uh, centre of the park. So uh, how do you see that particular battle going? It's a strange one. Like if you're going, if you're basing on the 1990s, you'd give it to Kerry. Uh, like again, I don't like knocking any player because it's not right. Because, but I, I look at the carry with O'Connor as a class thing. Then you have Morn. Morn showed then he doesn't have the legs for the seventy-five minutes. And this is a guy like he's won it all, been there, done that. But it shows his, his experience and importance and it, to the carry team that they keep bringing him back. They're missing that little percentage that he brings to the team. But it showed, I suppose, with the goal that Dublin got, it was a mistake by him, and it's just tiredness. And um, the guy, how much has he achieved over the years? But I suppose when you look at Galway, then what you have Paul Conroy again, another older statesman, you have Killing McDade then as well, and Conroy, probably the best football of his career in the first earlier matches. And I suppose that was probably his downfall in scenario where he was a marked man then after that, where it was kind of seen, especially with the Roscommon game, where we'll keep him quiet and you're saving him scoring four or five points because in the Mayo game and the, and the Leitrim game, he was outstanding. He was shooting for fun. Then Killing comes in, and Killing then, which again, an unbelievable, unbelievable underage talent, uh, very unfortunate with some serious injuries over the years after he came back from Australia um, but that then that's Australian Aussie rules uh, career which was short but it stood to him but you can see it now his fitness levels and his exp- and his, I suppose being a full time athlete showed it uh, outstanding outstanding in the, in the kind of final outstanding against Armagh like that last 20 minutes against Armagh he just ran the show like it's, it just it looks like he was getting fresher it was going on like they got a new set of batteries at, at, at the extra time part and then we saw the Derry match where it was kind of strange they cancelled each other out the Derry midfield and the Galway midfield but now this fine we're talking we have O'Connor we have Moran uh, O'Connor be more like as I said the, the, the midfield now where you're, you're, you're slim you can run all day himself and Killing McDade will block each other out then you have Paul Conroy and you have Moran there's very little in between them I, I, Jack Barry in the mix as well. Well, Jack Barry is another true. I forgot about Jack Barry there bringing him in, and he, he came in the last day. But it's funny where the, now the kickouts are bypassing midfield. So it's kind of a scenario where maybe Galway the last day we're actually kicking along, but it's all about inches now. You're trying to land the ball in a small space. So really it's all about the running game, the connection between the midfield is now a link between defence and attack. And they're really expected to score. So to me, it's going to be 
come down to small inches, small percentages where I see Goey having it, the little bit of advantage here, and this is in a way a snaring word, just that I think that they have had a harder battle to date. And I'm saying that against the players they've marked and regarding the games and the Armagh game. So I just think they have a little bit more. I think the scenario where I could probably see the likes of Paul Conroy coming in one or two and killing again in that scenario getting a goal, which is important for Galway. You've actually got Kevin Walsh coming up on the show this morning. Which one of you would mark David Moran if you were playing today? Uh, probably Kevin Owls he's got slow I used to see him get always the quick ones he used to get the more kind of bulkier ones in that scenario so I end up probably Mark O'Connor or Jack Barry but again um, like more like an, an awful as I say giant of a man uh, a serious uh, athlete in scenario what he's achieved to date and, and score and again I'm saying it it shows you the importance to carry where this is a guy probably now if he was still with the Goyle teams would be saying listen you've had your day but bringing him back and then showed his wealth in this first half when Kerry were dominating Dublin where he was there in the middle of it like you know but uh, regarding Kevin I suppose yeah he'd probably mark him at the stage you know but there'd be a good battle there a few handbags being thrown as well no harm with that like you know Who's going to win? It's a strange one I could see this actually ending in a draw yeah. and the only reason I'm going to give it to Galway is saying that we have probably the two sets up forwards probably the best in the country at the moment when you have David Clifford and Sean O'Shea but then you have Shane Welch and, and uh, Damien Comer so I think both sides it's going to come down to just a little mistake like a, a black card or something stupid like a goalkeeper mistake which we've been renowned to at this moment in time but I, I just think Galway could sneak it I don't know either it will go to a replay or Galway will just sneak it that's what I'm hoping for so uh, 2000 in the first instance anyway and maybe a different result in the replay well it'd be nice to do revenge I always say that I know they're not thinking that but for us old lads I wish they would do revenge on that one but um, I just think this Galway team have no fear um, they're, they're a team of um, I suppose uh, going into a final with a lot of confidence and nothing to lose and that's a strange one you say regarding you to lose and all Ireland I don't think they have anything to lose because it wasn't expected us to be there Kerry have this big burden of not having won in All Ireland and for eight years and the the Dublin voodoo thing where they hadn't beaten Dublin. But for us, it's a scenario where we've beaten them before in 2018 when Kevin was manager. So it's proved that we can do it. Um, we we know that we're as good as them, and I know that we have um, the same as say we're a footballing team that has a lot to achieve. And even we're we're only started the journey. This Kerry team, a lot of them been around for a while, and there's a lot of pressure. Like a lot of whoever thought there's a lot of that team that don't even have one All Ireland medal. That's, that's unheard of in Kerry team. Like, you know, take out more and, and that's it. Like, so if this Galway team have nothing to lose and this is only the start of their journey and that's what's going to, so we're going to hear a lot about this Galway team in the years to come. Sean, enjoy the rest of the build-up. Uh, I know you're not going to enjoy Sunday, as you already <laughs> said, but uh, try and analyse it as best you can. Thanks a million for being so generous with your time this morning. Gurumil Mahadon. Sean O'Donnell there in conversation with Owen Sheehan ahead of the game this coming Sunday. The time is now approaching four minutes before nine. OTBAM is brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. Delighted to say we are now joined by the former Galway manager Kevin Walsh. Kevin, nicely set up there uh, by Sean, mentioning 2018 when you were in charge for that win against Kerry in the Super 8. He's saying that the players now, those who are involved, should take a certain amount of confidence from having got a championship win against the Kingdom back four summers ago. Yeah, look, at it. I suppose it was kind of a, I think it was the first championship win since, since the 60s, so that was massive. And again, you know, the under-20s came through, then uh, we had a very fancy team in 2020, and they also beat Kerry, unexpected. So the last four or five years have been have been good to Galway, um, including the league win down, down, down in Tralee as well. So, um, look, at it, it, it certainly should, uh, I suppose, probably say to give them confidence that they can beat this Kerry team. Did that play in mind at all going into 2018? Were you talk about the long championship run where Kerry had dominated from the final in 65 right through to that win in 2018. Was that ever on the mind or anything that was talked about, like basically how long ago we had been waiting for a win? I would, of course, yeah. That, that, I mean, you can't avoid that, especially with the social media now. Mm. And all the facts and figures are always thrown out there. And, you know, I suppose even where Galway were concerned, it was more than that at the time. It was more that, that we had the big championship win since 2001 and, and the hoodoo of Crow Park. Everything was 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 big for that match in 2018. You know, that was a Super 8s match as well and it was, you know, the top two teams came out of, of, of a very difficult group. So, you know, we had Monaghan and Kildare at the time. So, and to have actually qualified early in that uh, group with, with Kerry involved was, was huge. And it, so it also, you know, as I said, it was it was not only the Kerry hoodoo, it was the Crow Park hoodoo. And it was a kind of, some of the hoodoos I made, I made too much of. But certainly where Kerry are concerned, back to the 60s, is quite a while. So that was that was huge to, to get over the line. 
Has a stake been driven into the heart of that idea of the Crow Park issue now? Because every time that Galway were preparing to go to Crow Park in recent years, it's been, you know, it's only so many wins since 2001 and there's so many defeats yeah. have happened. And even after the league final defeat, the late collapse against Roscommon earlier this year, people were mentioning that Galway have got a very poor record at Crow Park. They've now been there. They've won two difficult games against Ulster opposition in the quarterfinal and semifinal. They've had three runouts in Crow Park this year. Is that even a factor now going into this weekend? I don't think Grove Park was a factor on the back of look at it. 2018, as I said, we bet, we bet uh, Kerry. We had won the Division Two final against Kildare up there. Uh, you know, there was there was there was loads of things happening at the time. We performed very very well against Dublin in the league final, and and actually in the in the in the All Ireland semi final by the last 15 minutes. So just didn't take our chances. And again, you know, I suppose this game against Armagh leading up to the Derry match, I think. Galway's efficiency in front of goal was was very very high against Armagh, which you need that to happen to win big games. And unfortunately, 2018 the semi final, our efficiency in front of goal was shockingly poor in the first half. And if it been better, we could maybe take out the Dublin team in Crow Park in 2018. But the efficiency is, is massive, and it has been quite good for Galway in the last while. So, you know, a fit a fit Comer, uh, which is brilliant for Galway. You know, back over the number of years, he had a lot of bad injuries, and the, you know, it's important that he stays he stays injury free for the, for, the, for this big match as well. But Look, the Crow Park thing, to be honest, is that hoodoo is well and truly gone. Uh, Kerry have their own little hoodoo at the minute for, for winning the All-Ireland. It's only eight years, but it's, it's like a eternity for them down there. And even that Dublin match, I saw the way they celebrated beating the Dublin team. Uh, it was huge pressure off, off them because there's massive pressure down there. And and again, that was a Dublin team that would not, in my opinion, wouldn't be next or near where the Dublin team was back in 2018. So, you know, to see Kerry celebrating that, uh, was huge for them, but that wasn't you know a team with Conor Callan, Paul Mannion, Jack McCaffrey, Michael Jarrah, you know, Philip McMahon, all going out of it. A lot of those guys genuinely had not been replaced at the same level. So, uh, I suppose getting over the line by one point against Dublin, uh, the Dublin team missing Conor Callan, you know, it's not massive form, but it's good form for them because they needed to get that hood off the back. Yeah. Let's have a chat about Damien Comer then when we look at our kind of five key matchups that you've picked out going into this weekend. You're Comer scoring the uh, two goals last time out against Derry to help go away through to the final for the first time since 2001. He's likely to go up against Foley this weekend, isn't he? I would think so, yeah. Uh, it, lo- it looks that way. Um, <clears throat> but I would think, you know, look at Kerry or Longer for round play. Tally is on there as well. Uh, I'd expect that there will be a bit more help defence on with, with Foley. I thought Derry were very naive to be honest with you um, they had all the bodies back but they just uh, you know wrote an article examiner about it where you know Rogers was completely looking at Comer and he didn't see, he could not see when the ball was coming which for me is technically very very poor defending uh, albeit totally concentrated on the man and given the job to do but you have to see man as he ball and that didn't happen against Terry I'd expect that uh, Kerry will mark that differently uh, I'd also think they'll have help defence a bit closer to Homer so it's fine having all the bodies back behind the 45 metre line but you have to know your role inside a defensive system and I thought maybe it's part of Jerry's build, building at the minute but they just weren't uh, clinical in, in, in that defending side of it I expect Kerry to be more clinical on that and uh, Paitali will know the threat that Comer uh, possesses as well in particularly left 1v1 and he'll also know that if it's tightly defended and there's help defence and there's two on him you know, sometimes Damien, and he's obviously grown up a bit, but he, he may make bad decisions and try to kick when it's not on. So he's going to try and create an environment that maybe will try to put Damien into what we call the ugly zone or out of his comfort zone. So uh, I expect this to be fairly defensive. Have you noticed a change in the collective way that Kerry have defended this year with Tally and O'Connor? Have they actually changed things around a bit? Because a lot's been made of the fact that they haven't conceded too many goal chances. It took almost a, a wonder strike to actually get a green flag for Dublin the last day. But generally, league and championship this year, Kerry have looked pretty safe at the back. They have, to be fair. And uh, they're getting the bodies back a bit more. Uh, um, Tyke Marley seems to be the guy that's doing the sweeping. <clears throat> I'm not convinced that he's... The full sweeper role picked up yet. Uh, you know, uh, the ball is more than one kick away. I, you know, it should be marking space when it's less than the kick away from the full forward or the threat. It should be a little bit further back to protect that that the full back. And uh, I just think there's a little gap left there all the time for pop passes like to John Daly, a very good foot passer, to pop passes into like of Homer if that's not blocked up. Um, again, but uh, to be fair, you know, there's a good bit, good bit made out of for Kerry to concede and not concede it. 
But if you look at the Dublin team that played Cork, uh, they didn't get a smell of a goal chance. Um, that was without Conor Callum. So for me, the Dublin team up front at the minute I haven't got a Paul Mannion or a Conor Callan who are the goal threats. And, and so, you know, their forward line isn't made up of goal threats at the minute. So well, I'm, not, I'm not so sure on which that Kerry team actually tested in championship in relation to a good forward line like that who will go at you. So look, at it, it, it'll, it'll be interesting to see where, where they've come on Sunday. Yeah, I, that's actually an intriguing side to the uh, battle and the conversation because I was alongside Ross Munley <laughs> for uh, the quarterfinals the round before and we were just thinking that about Dublin and Cork because the game had drifted. So you're almost watching Dublin to see where the movement is in the forward line in the second half. And all of their inside forwards that day look to come back out to recycle the ball back out to the D. Now, they kicked plenty of scores and they won very comfortably. But without Con, there was nobody to go in behind. While Galway present a very different challenge where like Walsh and Comer are going to look to try and stretch that defence this weekend. Yeah, but in particular Comer in the in the inside where he'll turn and go at you. Well, Shane does a lot of his, of his movement down the wings. And, you know, he's going to have to try, slightly change or something and try and get inside the man and, and, and have more of an impact because... While it's fine running and taking people on, it's, it's the middle three lanes that counts, you know. Then one lane five in the outside, it's where. And you know that's another part where probably Dave Clifford will be if, he, if he's if he's the only defender, he'll do a lot of his work out on lane five and recycling as well if he doesn't get nearly shot. So, like, Comer is like Conor Callan. He puts a head down. He'll get under your hand. He'll create freeze. He will take you on at all costs if the space is there where other forwards won't do that you know and this is the first time I suppose Kerry are going to be facing that a type of a threat providing that we get the ball in there David Clifford a problem to try and solve three goals and six points when the sides met in Trillie a couple of years <clears> ago in the league so we've seen the damage that he can <clears> do <throat> who picks him up? Well to be fair you know, like, like things have completely changed that league match I mean Galway at that time had spent a year and a half I suppose attack, attack, attack and left left the defensive team behind them so they've completely changed in the last year uh, you can see it during the league so they've gone back to in a way back where we were ourselves and they've you know they've I probably learned the lesson the hard way so I don't expect Cliff, Clifford getting a 3-6 on Sunday even though it's a bigger pitch in, in, in Crow Park you're going to find probably that Galway will, will have you know if the city goes the same as Jerry they'll have 15 behind the, behind the halfway line for the first half so Again, that's something I'd like to see that they, could, they would keep at least two up uh, because we're going to need a transition to put Kerry in the back foot. It can't be just all about defending either. So I suppose it's gone from one extreme, like the match you spoke about on Tony Kerry two years ago, to the other extreme now. So, you know, we will have to put that Kerry team in the back foot as well. Uh, but I would say we have to leave two two up and uh, get the, you know, if we have to lose a sweeper or two, we probably don't need three or four sweepers, which we have at the minute. Uh, but just to get that balance right, does that mean a man marker on David Clifford or is it more about the <laughs> zonal if they're going to stop ball coming into him? Well, to be honest, I, I do expect there'll be a man marker. It, it probably, you know, it, it'll be either Liam Sake or Sean Kelly, depending on what they go with. I, I would guess it'd be that. Uh, so uh, the matchup I've picked would be Liam Sake against Clifford, but it could be Sean Kelly. So it, that'll be that. But, but they'll, have, they'll have help defence around them. That'll be zonal. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Uh, and if they don't, you know, it doesn't matter who's Martin Clifford, if he gets easy ball and no help around there, uh, you know, he, he's, he's going to be a massive threat. So, look, at it. it's going to be a zonal with the man-to-man there anyway. Uh, I don't expect the Galway going to go like they did 18 months ago down to Lee. If that won't happen. Uh, so, it will be. It, it'll be it'll be zonal around Clifford. But Clifford will not do the Damien Comer job or the Con, Con Callan job where he's going to bury the head and go down and go through two, two or three fellas. He'll be trying to hit the hit the point on his second step, which he's very good at. Uh, most forwards will take four steps before they hit, so he can hit him too. So it's really vital that whoever's on him does a man marking job, and that he's actually stuck to him. Yeah, he's remarkably hard to stop. I mean, it's an obvious point, but the fact that he drifts into such kind of interesting pockets of space, he almost plays so instinctively. And we saw that at different times, even against Dublin, where maybe he's gone quiet for a little while, then he drifts off into a pocket of space. We saw in the quarterfinal where the one chance he got in behind where space opened up, he puts the ball into the top corner. He's remarkably good at ghosting into good positions, isn't he? Absolutely brilliant. Absolutely. And again, it's even the second half against Dublin, you know, the, when he won that free, the last one, you know, you're quite second half. But Kerry are keeping him up all the time, and they're not. You know, he's not part of of, of their defence. And again, that's what I'd like to see Damien Comer as well as much as possible, or at least, at least um, maybe coming out for ten minutes and going back in, but keeping a threat up at all times. Uh, Kerry will be doing that. 
But I don't expect David Clifford to be given the spaces that he's been given to date. Uh, as I said at the start of this, uh, it's going to be, I would think, very defensive. And uh, that takes out the spaces that I said Clifford and O'Shea, and O'Shea likes. I suppose looking from a Kerry point of view, they'll be hoping and they'll be trying to put pressure on awful early to try and get ahead. Because, you know, if it's like the Derry game was, the longer that goes on, the better it is for Galway. Um, I do believe that if Galway can be there or come down the stretch, which, is, which I think they should be, there's no reason why not. What, what we spoke about, start the programme here in 2018, down the 20s, talent is coming through. Uh, but if they can be down the stretch, you saw what happened. I mean, Kerry, there's massive pressure on Kerry. There's massive pressure on Kerry. They brought a man down from Tyrone. Uh, Jack O'Connor is back in there. The expectation now of the beating Dublin is to absolutely win this All Ireland. This is not a case of, well, you know, we had a great year. It's not a great year now unless they win All Ireland. So if there's 10, 15 minutes there and Kerry haven't got away from the pack, like against Dublin, you know, it happened against Cork in 2000, Tyrone in 2021. Uh, again, last week against Dublin, when the, the goal came in from, from, from Dublin, it was a nervy, nervy ending. And I know they got a massive free at the end. Uh, to get them out of the gap but you know if that went down longer where would it be it's hard to know but certainly there's, there's nerves in there if uh, if Kerry don't get, 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 get in and get ahead Kevin I'm interested in your take on Keane O'Neill <coughs> because we've mentioned Paddy Talley coming into the Kerry backroom setup, mm-hmm. and you know Mike Quirk after you left Leash went in with Jack O'Connor for this year in Kerry's a stacked backroom team I was listening to Park Joyce's comments from last week about uh, O'Neill and he was basically saying look I brought him in. This is a guy, sometimes we argue, sometimes we disagree tactically or we disagree about things. But sometimes having that dissenting voice into your backroom team is no bad thing. You need it. I mean, look, I've always said this, and you always hear me talking about a challenge being environment. It has to be a challenge being environment. I think sometimes too many management teams surround themselves with, with best friends or ex-footballers and, you know, you're all of the same thinking. And, you could, you know, to, to, to evolve as a person or a coach or to learn, you have to bring people in who's going to challenge you. And it cannot be oh, you know what, that's great, this is the way we'll do it, and we'll all take the blame together. That cannot be what it is. This has to be uh, a challenging environment, and there's no doubt, I'm sure that's what Keane done. Keane himself has, is, would, be, would be fairly opinionated, I, I, I'd be guessing. I don't know the man very well. I spoke to him once twice on the phone, <clears throat> but in fairness to him, he's steeped in, in, in trying to improve. So, you know, he's, he's um, brought, I suppose, a level of organisation. He's brought, I, I'd be absolutely very clear that they probably do have arguments and they should have arguments, uh, in what to do but you know things have changed since he has come in uh, it seems I suppose that uh, the belief has kicked in there they are definitely have come back to a lot of what we're doing ourselves albeit maybe maybe slightly different um, but now the trick for them is to find how do they stay defensively strong without using all the all the bodies in behind the first offensive line or defensive line because you're taken from the top and if you take two people from the top uh, for your trick trick transition, you're not going to put the other team on the on, on the opposite foot quick enough. So that's to find that balance. And again, you know, if you if you have three or four sweepers in behind your defensive line, you as I said, you lose up front. If you take them out, you can put them on your first defensive line, and that automatically releases two people to go up front. So it's it'd be interesting to see if you can find that over there over the. Um, the last two weeks. That's Keane O'Neill trying to give you a ring right there, Kevin. Yeah, couple of, a couple of other battles <laughs> before you uh, chat to Keane about the weekend. Um, a veteran <laughs> one here, two players who are uh, now I think into their 14 seasons at senior level in David Moore and Paul Conroy who are likely to pick each other up. Paul Conroy, yeah. Um, <clears throat> oh yeah, I, I, I expect so. Um, I think I think Paul is 33 and David's 34 now. I'd expect that they will pick each other up. Um, probably Jack Barry going on to McDade. Uh but you see, I suppose the big thing here is the the high press from, from both teams on, on the kickouts. And if both teams are successful in the high press, uh, that means the ball is going to go long. Um, so you're going to have an area battle. And sometimes in a lot of GA today, you don't see that much because it's quick kickout after quick kickout. Kick out. Um, so I dubbed a goal against Derry. They had five and four up in the front through forward line and three or four in behind that. They had nine up in the front field, which means you know they were actively pushing Jerry to put that ball out long at all costs. Uh, you know, will Kerry be, will they've done their homework on that? Will they overload one side instead of running around like Jerry done and get the bodies on one side to negate some of the, of the, of the front push? All that type of stuff, I suppose, I presume Kerry will be looking at to, to, to negate that type of stuff. Uh, 
But, you know, if that is the case, the aerial battle will be massive between um, Moran and, and Conway. And, you know, look, it's it's, it's hard to know who's a better on that one. But, I mean, Dave Moran would, would have always been a big fielder. And uh, I suppose Kerry, Kerry would be hoping that he'll have the strength in that. And the final battle that you've picked out is Shane Walsh, we mentioned, has been the danger man, the top scorer for Goa this year, up against <laughs> Thomas Sullivan. Yeah, and any time we were there before Thomas Sullivan actually picked up Shane all the time, so I'd be fairly sure that that's what will happen. Look, maybe they may turn around the day and, and say, well, you know what, Tom, we'll put you on someone else because you've been scoring two and three points yourself and we'll release you. Maybe they might do that, but I expect that they'll put him on Shane Walsh and uh, just to, 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 to give him full attention because same happening against, against Jerry, the young McCluskey was brilliant against Shane and, 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 and in that game kept Shane out of the game. The Armagh guys was a little bit different there was a bit of, I suppose, more 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 attention off the ball than what McCluskey gave. But I suppose Shane has to find a way, and his teammates have got to help him find a way to uh, get into this final and you know make a huge impact on Cole Park because while Shane is top scorer. Um, his impact hasn't been as high as he'd like in the last two or three games. So I presume that's something Parik will be working on very hard to try and get Shane released a little bit because uh, we know what he can do if he gets open space, but we also know that if he's kept quiet that he may get a little bit frustrated so that's important to get Shane to the game fairly quickly and again maybe give him his 10 minutes inside up, up front and let Damien back for 5 minutes but we always try and keep one of those two danger guys up front is really, really important Yeah some really key battles this weekend Kevin enjoy the game on Sunday Welcome guys Thanks man That's former Goway boss uh, Kevin Walsh of course we're going to be going to the Kingdom uh, tomorrow to get a full perspective on Kerry ahead of the match on Sunday afternoon OTBM is brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day Here's what's coming up on OTB Sports Radio later at 1pm we're going to have some OTB Gold Emmanuel Petit when he was in Dublin a few years ago uh, Stuart Lancaster at 3pm uh, we've also got a retro panel from 4 which is facing the Hacker from 1991 OTB Gold at 6pm is looking back to the great Wexford team of the 1950s Wexford 1956 and then we've got live OTB this evening with Nathan Murphy in the hot seat he's going to be joined by Johnny Joyles as usual on a Thursday we've got plenty more besides you can follow Off the Ball across all of our social channels subscribe to our YouTube channel and be sure to download the OTB Sports app for the very latest and best in sports news content and analysis we're going to be back after a short break with Ollie Turner from Galway Bay FM who spoke to Owen during his trip to the City of the Tribes OTB AM on OTB Sports Radio Ireland's first and only sports radio station The best rugby insight and analysis When you watch a guy Ger, standing on the sideline counting players with his fingers you know this is bullshit OTB Sports Rugby We talk about having to give Carberry and these players more time but even if we give them more time they're not going to hit the level that, that Johnny is hitting at and what he brings out of other players Subscribe to the rugby stream on the OTB Sports app now Things that put people off on a first date. Showing up late and getting your name wrong? Always a great start. Looking at their phone more than you? Eh, uh, hello? Someone who only talks about themselves? Oh, really? God, aren't you great? Look, no one said dating is perfect, but at godating.ie, we promise we'll always try and find your perfect match. Because somewhere out there, there's someone for you. And godating.ie will help you find them. Yes, even you, socks and sandals guy. Go on, go for it with godating.ie OTB AM With Gillette, get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar Okay, we are here with Ollie Turner of Galway Bay FM We're sitting here in Taft's pub tactically covering up a photo of Gooch Cooper uh, over my shoulder here. Uh, how are you feeling about this weekend? It looks like it's, uh, there's a great buzz around the county and the city so far. It's extraordinary because my own personal thoughts would be that, you know, I'd be giving Galway a, a less than 50-50 chance and yet everywhere I go around the county, everybody is on such a high and they're talking up Galway's chances. So now I'm more convinced than ever that, that something special might happen here. I'm trying to work out the logic behind that and then the more that it's analysed and thrown at me about the significance of Kerry knocking out Dublin and the fact that you know we have a, at least a, a recent muscle memory of a championship victory over Kerry in Croke Park, that perhaps this may not be as, as obvious an All-Ireland final as some people are, are considering. It's strange, isn't it, the way that that happens over the course of All-Ireland Week. No matter what game it is, the underdog just gets the sense of belief. And the closer the game comes, all of a sudden, all those reasons that you thought you might not be able to win just disappear into the background. Yeah, well, hold on a minute now. There's, there's belief, and then there's just blind loyalty. So this is Galway now we're talking about. This is not Mayo. 
uh, and there is a sense of realism. And we're probably the one county in Ireland who would just tell you straight out, we're not going to win, or we are going to win, or you know, we have a good chance of winning. And it is that middle ground that most people are taking that they think, oh, we have a genuinely good chance. So not that I'd be promoting betting or anything like that, but people are fixated by match odds. Yeah. And so when you see stuff like 100 to 30 or better than 3 to 1 Galway, that is a nonsense. Yeah. I mean, that does not bear any sort of reality to adding up all of the bits of both squads and throwing them into a mix. And you tell me that, OK, let's say they play 10 times. Kerry probably wins six or seven, but don't tell me that Galway won't win two or three times. And you just hope that one of those two or three times is this Sunday. For example, Kerry, at least last week after the semi-final, were shorter odds to win their all Ireland than Limerick were to win the hurling, which just doesn't make any sense. No, and I think you have to discard that. And real, really, when we talk about it, Owen, like we sit here and we we preview the match and we give our opinion, but nobody knows because at the end of the day, a lot of little things will add up to deciding what happens on Sunday. And sure, you can take it that you know if normal things happen and David Clifford plays well because that's what he does well of course Kerry are going to win but that's Porrick Joyce's job is to stop the normal things happening from Kerry uh, and to try and insist that his own team does as much good as they can so when it all goes into the mix all we can do is give our opinions and then see what comes out the other side um, you know will Galway win will Kerry win I can't tell you I mean we'll know that after five o'clock and that's an obvious thing to say but you look at all the variables that's all we can do and try and come up with an opinion and I think the more I understand where people are coming from um, as regards their talking up of Galway's chances the more I start to understand that you know psychology is probably as big a part of what's going to decide this All-Ireland final than any physical manifestation of what these two teams can produce on the day. And what I mean by that is you look at the two matadors in Jack O'Connor and Porrick Joyce. Slightly different eras, perhaps, but yet you're looking at two very driven men with their own linear view on how the game is played and how their county is portrayed and how they play the game and how they treat the opposition and how they should perform. Again, both men have you know, left a, a load of players behind them in the, in the course of their careers. You know, carry players that have walked away, have been disregarded. Boric Joyce has gone through a lot of players as well. And he made that point after Derry when he was pumping the fists up to the crowd. And he made that point in the aftermath that, you know, for these Galway players who stuck with him. And that was a key phrase because a lot haven't. And you're talking about well into the double digits of footballers who have been part of Porrick Joyce's initial thoughts back in 2020 who are now no longer there. There's an all-star in there. There's lots of big-name players in there that are not going to be part of this Galway panel. So what he has now are a very committed crew on. And you know this from going around to the Dubs and the Currys and even the, the Hurling, the Limericks and the Kilkenny's. There's a modern-day mindset now amongst managers that I think has been largely influenced by Jim Gavin's success. And that's to create this cult, this tight inner circle where nothing goes out. That's why you're down here interviewing me, a former Galway minor, and not a current Galway senior, because there's nothing coming out of any camp. It's watertight, and they create this them and us sort of atmosphere. And then within that camp, you have to try and just, based on their performances then, just try and suss out, well, what is going on with Galway? Are they improving, and are they getting to Kerry's level? Yeah. It's really interesting, and one of the questions I had with regard to that is, you know, the, the, the noise that surrounds a team. We're seeing it in both football and we're seeing it in hurling, and I'm not sure if it's a controversial question or not, but how does this week, in terms of hype around a team, differ to the last time Galway were in a hurling final? Let's not compare to the last time we were in a football final. How does this compare to, say, the 2018 build-up for think, the footballers, yeah, the I hurlers? Think, I think Michal Dunahu was a far more accessible manager, yet managed the situation, yet knew, I think, the importance of certainly from a local media perspective, you know, drip-feeding a certain amount. And yet, uh, there was a bigger lead-in time, obviously. Uh, so they would have got their media duties out of the way probably last week with a week to spare. And that's fine. And I think even as journalists, we understand that, you know, we're like supporters. We don't want to be bothering players on the week of a big game. And that's fine. So when you're doing an interview, for instance, and, you know, it might be more than a week before the match, you try and talk to the players. Look, at, can we just pretend that this is 
the Tuesday before the game rather than the Tuesday week. So you're not referencing Sunday week and it sounds like it's kind of out of date. So there's stuff like that goes on. But in fairness, um, it was far easier to get players and to get members of the management. Even if there was something on the Monday night or the Tuesday night before the game and we wanted something, that was doable. Now it's just shut down. And I mean, there was absolutely nothing out of Galway of any description before the Armagh or Derry games. You know, I mean, there was just no interviews whatsoever, which is disappointing. And yet, you know, did it matter that much to the Galway public? Probably not. At that stage, they were on the crest of a wave. But to answer your question, there's been an enormous change in terms of how inter-county managers treat the public and the media in terms of accessibility in the last, I'd say I've noticed it in particular in the last three years. It's not just a COVID thing. I think it's a copycat mechanism from the dub. So the sooner that we get Eugene McGee back in charge of an All-Ireland winning team where everybody comes and kicks around as part of a, a training session with an All-Ireland winning team on the Friday night before the All-Ireland final, the better. <laughs> Uh, the, the other point of that then is um, the difference between the football fraternity and the hurling fraternity. Talk, talk to me about that because, I mean, it is one of the great dual counties that we're in at the moment. Do you embrace that as well? Do, do the public tend to embrace both sides or do you see different people coming out of the woodwork for the different sports? I mean, there's definitely a, a dividing line in Galway between hurling and football. And yet there would be far more football people that would be inclined to go to hurling matches like I come from a, a place in North Galway Dunmore uh, where I live and Dunmore McHale's would be a well known club and they would have two to three buses going to every Galway hurling championship game for the last number of years that would encompass all that North Galway area like Glenamaddy Williamstown Clamburn they would just take huge interest look at a lot of that was Joe Canning a lot of that was the fact that they were getting to semi-finals and finals and, and winning an odd Leinster so I guess you know, you'd go away fans who were starved of any sort of football success, really, in the last decade and a half, who were looking to jump onto some bandwagon, and they did. But be that as it may, I have to say this week, on Tuesday night in the Lockery Hotel, there was a fundraiser. The reason it's in the Lockery Hotel, it's owned by Supermax, the sponsor. So fair enough. It was dominated, that large attendance, by hurling people that were there. Now, granted, you might say, well, if Pat McDonough comes knocking as a sponsor and a lot of his suppliers are based in hurling country, they're not going to say no. But yet the top table was Pat Spillane, Kevin Welch and Gary Sice. You could hear a pin drop. These were largely hurling people. I would say 60-40 hurling football in the room, 400 people. They were totally engaged in what was going on. I spoke to a number of them afterwards. Uh, you know, people like... Eamon Durvin, whose father Ned Durvin would have been a crucial part of the Galway team that would have played back in the late 50s and in that infamous decade they spent in Munster in the 60s. Wonderful player, hurling tradition steeped in a club that's now Tina Abbey Denary. He could tell me about Shane Welsh, Damien Comer. What are they going to do with Clifford? Is it Sean Kelly that's on him? He was a guy that was invested in it. And I thought to myself, you know what, that's really interesting now because I'd be used to hurling guys talking about you know, Aidan Hart getting forward from wing back and being able to pick a score. Fellas down in Dunmore talking to me about that. Uh, and we've regularly had Aidan Hart and his dad Josie down in Dunmore talking hurling at functions. And here we are now with the balance tilting back towards the football. Are we a complete dual county in that everywhere you go, everybody's interested in hurling and football? No. We're more of a dual county, I think, though, than Cork, which is probably... 90-10 hurling football is that fair to say um, I think probably the closest to us in terms of proper duality would be Offaly in the strictest sense of the world um, I think Dublin will always be hugely imbalanced towards the football because of just the nature of, of the setup in the county even though with Anthony Daly we saw you know, a good upsurge in their fortunes in the hurling albeit somewhat temporarily the Matty Kenny project has finished without silverware so I'd still put their balance at probably 80-20 football hurling even though a lot of money has gone into hurling but we're, we're definitely more of a hurling county than a football in terms of just sheer numbers Owen. but I think your question was is there an interest in the football from the hurling side I have to say it's a big yes and that's probably down to the wins over Armagh and Derry. This thing has grown legs. That's really interesting. What about on a kind of a, a deeper sort of 
political level then within, I don't mean the county board, I mean club, at club level in, the, in this county. It, it, are there divisions uh, across the county just as somebody as an outsider looking in? Is, is there like a suspicion in football areas towards uh, people walking around with a hurley and vice versa with the big ball? Look, at, I'm not going to go saying anything too divisive here. I mean, there are a number of dual clubs and it's within them I think you need to ask the question. So, you know, if you go to places like Athenry, who have a football element and would have had a Galway player in recent years in Tom Flynn. Uh, you know, but they're always going to be primarily hurling because of their history and their heritage, and yet they maintain a, a football side to their club and a down likewise. There's, there's loads of clubs. Salt Hill um, would have a, a strong hurling tradition, although they're a footballing powerhouse. So I think in fairness, a lot of that comes from the top table. And I have to say that Galway GA turned a corner in the appointment of a hurling man, Paul Bellew, but a man who is very much looking at the bigger picture, and he looks at Galway on a macro level, and is fighting tooth and nail to make sure that there is this one brand of Galway. So the hurlers, for instance, now have been the last couple of years, train out in Loch George, which was for years, Onud Pell Nagalyeva. It's a football centre. It was built by football people. Pat Egan, John Power, Mike O'Kelly, John Joe Holler, and those lads that were around in 98 and 01. It was the kind of corporate money that came in from those successes that built Loch George. The hurlers went down the road of purchasing a huge area of ground in Mountain South and Athenry to do something similar. And, of course, the timing went belly up because of what happened in 08. And they were caught. And thus, Galway were, were left with a debt we're still servicing that, but at the rate at which corporate tables are being sold this week for the football final, I'd say that debt won't be long being wiped out. Um, but, sure. but the hurlers of footballers are now using the same area. Of course, it's a, it's a centre of excellence. It's not a quarter big enough of what it should be. But in terms of solidifying the atmosphere in the county uh, and the partnership of hurling and football, I think a lot of it comes from the county board and the personalities that are there. And in Paul Bellew, as a leader, I think Galway G are very lucky right now to have somebody who's bringing everybody together. And he's doing a great job. One last question on, on that topic. Like uh, When I was in Limerick last week for the hurling, uh, somebody said to me, you're in the, the sports capital of Ireland. And, I mean, I can see why Limerick people say that, but the varying sports that are at your disposal if you live in this city is actually remarkable when you have I guess this year when you have two teams that are very very competitive in both codes you have Galway United and you have the sports ground obviously seeing some really exciting rugby when rugby season uh, is in full flow it does seem like right now if you want to pick one of the, the rising sports capitals of Ireland you could probably pin your cap on Galway Galway's always been the sports capital it's just we don't shout it's about the sports capital well, we don't shout about it like Cork or Dublin, but I'm just talking, let's talk about local radio, Owen, and I'll talk about my job. So when, when we're looking at a weekend schedule on Galway Bay FM, Owen, it's lunatic stuff. So Friday night we've Galway United. Granted, they're in the Airtristy League First Division. They're battling with Cork City. But, like, there's a big rising tide there with John Coffey. They probably have a bigger budget than half the Premier League teams. So that's one element of it. Connacht Rugby have been a remarkable story. We were there back in 2002, marching to Dublin with... Well, five or six hundred Connacht fans met with a couple of thousand in Dublin and marched down to the IRFU to stop this nonsense and a bit of pressure and media coverage meant that Connacht eventually got to the point where we are now where you know post Pat Lamb we're a really solid outfit where we've got guys contributing to Ireland winning a series in New Zealand so that's outside of GEA and then you look at what's happening in in terms of Gaelic games which is obviously for most media outlets in Ireland it's still the biggest thing you know you can talk about soccer and rugby but still GA is the one that captures the most column inches in papers uh, the most tweets when it comes to something you post online the most clicks and in terms of our coverage we're lucky that between women and men we are just so competitive so every year it's not inexpensive to book a phone line in Croke Park or whatever media access you need and a lot of stations will be going gee that's a lot of money should we do it Galway Bay FM don't hesitate because we get there nine or ten times every year. We're on a Beano. It's like a, just a, 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 like a bulk deal. We'll take a pallet of those phone lines, please, because we're going to be there like this year for a National Football League final, albeit Division 2. We're going to be there with the hurlers because they're in Leinster, so we're going to get probably a Leinster semi-final and a final in there. Somewhere along the line, the under-20s or the minors are going to get in there in either or both codes and end up playing Coker for some way, shape or form. And then, of course, we've got the Camogie and the ladies' football which have been flying in recent years. Camogie defending All-Ireland champions at senior level. 
you know, they're playing Kilkenny on Saturday night in Croke Park. There's a good chance if they win that, it'll be probably Cork in the final again. And those three have been dominating Camogie. Ladies footballers were most unlucky not to beat Meath, but they're coming back up again. So the point being, we're competitive at pretty much every level in GA, minor, under 20, senior, hurling and football, ladies football and camogie. And in a club, we have this beast, Curra Finn, for the last decade that have been utterly dominating the championship more than Cross McGlain or Nemo Rangers in the past or any other team. And we've been following their journey. Galway have won more All-Ireland club titles in hurling than any other county, even allowing for Ballyhale's success. So we're waiting a few years since the post-Joe Canning Portumna dominance for the St. Thomas's effort to take over at All-Ireland club level. But we're normally there. OK, so maybe it's not St. Patrick's Day anymore. It might be a little bit earlier. But to get to the chase, from January right through to December, we're flat to the mass. Pretty much 12 months of the year with some code, with some sport. And then we look at, you know, we have Olympians. You know, we've got people going out winning rowing medals uh, for Ireland, as we had in, 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 in the recent Olympics in Beijing. Uh, so, like, or in, in Tokyo, I should say. So, like, it doesn't matter what sport whether even on a minority level there's going to be a Galway thumbprint I mean look at jockeys and horse racing the Galway races is one element okay we're mad for a full week but outside of that you know we'll be following Lee Roach or we'll be following young Ross Ryan over in England and they're winning four or five times a week and nobody says a thing about it and we don't tend to shout about it because you know what it's took down as our fifth story beneath all Ireland victories and Galway United and Connacht Rugby and what not so Sporting capital, I'd like to hear an argument from somewhere else. Oh, you've heard it here first. We are actually in the sports capital of Ireland uh, this week. So, this Sunday, call it for us, first of all. I mean, look, if I'm being rational about it, I still think that the logic would say that Kerry will win. That's fair enough, isn't it? I think. Um, and I deal in logic. Now, I'll be there commentating on the game, and we always, on local radio, give it a, a slight bias. I don't think I'm going to be quite as animated as Kerry Radio are for Sean Shea's point. I call out Tim Moynihan here. Until I get to the Tim Moynihan part at the end of the game where <laughs> Shane Walsh is a free from 55 metres to win the game and then Turner goes bananas. Um, look, at, I think if Galway are in the game, I'll put it this way, if Galway are in the game later on, there's a steeliness now that Port Joyce has created that could see them do something special, which is a bit ironic me saying that because in all of the games this year, Galway have been in control later on and have kind of stumbled over the line as in the cases with Mayo and Castlebar Ross Common conceding like you know two goals late on when they should have been winning that game by 10 points in the Connacht final Armagh six points up time up and concede two crazy goals to go to extra time and penalties Derry was the one game where tactically I could see Porrick Joyce has now really matured and turned a game that was ugly and nearly going nowhere for 20 minutes into a masterclass and I think if he can win that tactical battle with O'Connor, and it'll be fascinating to see what goes on there, we will probably know after 20 minutes, if you ask me this question, halfway through the first half, um, how the match is going to go. I think at that point, Galway should have some sort of a foothold in the game tactically. And if it's anyways close and exciting, um, I think Galway have a wonderful chance and will, in every possibility and probability, win the game. Because I think the weight of history... The weight of expectation is far more on Kerry. This is lovely for Galway. It's a breakthrough in Porrick's third year. It's probably bought him, let's be fair, another two years of his experiment. Well, remember, he, I interviewed him uh, on the very first day yeah. when he took the job out in Lockjaw. He's excited a lot this week. And that, those, those quotes have been bandied around where he said straight out, I said, Porrick, what's your expectation? What are you hoping to win? Year one in All-Ireland. If I don't win in All-Ireland year one, it's failure. They lost to Mayo, COVID. Granted, it just went pear shape. Year two, again, COVID, disaster. Lost to Mayo in Croke Park, but no other chance after that. By golly, he's got it right this year when he's got his first proper tilt at fulfilling exactly what he said to me on day one. So let's wipe away the COVID years. This is the first proper championship that Galway have prepared for. They celebrated after beating Mayo in Castle Bar for good reason, because he knew that was part of his plan. This is the pathway to the All-Ireland final that we want. Who is there is irrelevant. Now it's Kerry. Is that going to bother him? Not. But he's 17 minutes away from fulfilling his own prophecy, his own promise, his own statement. Anything other than winning in All-Ireland in Porrick Joyce's world is a failure. And he wasn't a failure too many times as a player. That's very true. Um, if people want to hear more of this good stuff, they can pop into the Supermax on O'Connell Street on Saturday, I understand, and the Crow Park Hotel before the game. Sunday morning, 9 o'clock until 12 o'clock. 
uh, will be there gathering the slow-moving Galway fans as they get up uh, on, on the main motorway and come into town. And then we're outside the Crow Park Hotel between 12 and 2. Won't be me, by the way. I'll be in doing my study and getting my notes ready for the, the 3.30 broadcast. But nonetheless, it's just to create that feel of excitement with the Galway and Kerry fans. And then, look, there's no point me saying what's going to happen after the match because it's very simple. If Galway win, the county will go mad. There will be people sleeping in baths in the Carlton and Blanchardstown. There won't be rooms booked because there won't need to be. People won't be worried about the cost of hotels in Dublin because the cost of sleeping on a floor is zero. And that's what will happen. Um, however, defeat, it's a different story. You suck it up. We'll still be very proud of those lads and there'll be a big reception back into Ballinasloe and Shum and Galway on the Monday. Everybody's really proud of this team because there's just a little sense that, you know what, even from the hurling fraternity, and going back to your point, Owen, from a few minutes ago, the hurlers have been in the limelight for a good while now. The footballers are getting back there now. They're getting their day in the sun. And by golly, if they're to match what the hurlers did in 2017, I think you'll see a celebration like none other. It'll be an outpouring. It'll be great relief. There'll be a lot of stuff going on as regards why Galway would celebrate this one as much, if not more, than any previous All-Ireland. Kerry will say the same thing. But be that as it may, I think we'll be on the journey with them. And it's a journey that will take a few twists and turns. There'll be refereeing decisions, there'll be controversy, there'll be you know, people getting injured, there'll be subs coming in. Somebody will be the story on Sunday evening. Who that individual might be, who knows? Will it be a Damien Comer? Will it be a Shane Walsh? But all of these guys must be so excited. Can you imagine if you're a player again looking forward to this, knowing that you have a chance here of being something that will go down in the annals forevermore and be talked about like a Porrick Joyce or a John Keenan or one of the great Galway players from the past, a Sean Purcell, of being the one to have done it on the biggest stage of all. And for us to have the privilege of being there, putting a microphone in front of our face to be able to call it, is a great privilege and one I don't take for granted. Try and enjoy it as much as you can, Ali. It's going to be a brilliant occasion, no doubt, on Sunday. And thanks a million for your time. Enjoy the week. Oh, and you're very welcome to come any time to the sporting capital of Ireland. There you go, the sporting capital of Ireland, Galway. That is Galway Bay FM's Ollie Turner, their sports editor, speaking to Owen uh, during his trip uh, to the City of the Tribes. OTBM, of course, is brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. OTBM will be back tomorrow morning from half past seven. Owen is on his way south currently uh, to the Kingdom. We'll be turning our attention for a Kerry preview for the best part on Friday. We'll also have our quick picks where we no doubt pick the wrong team going into the final for Sunday ahead of the All-Ireland Senior Football Decider. Uh, producer on the show today was Colin Book. Thanks to Joe Cardosa who was also vision mixing. Right now we're going to leave you with the former Ireland and Lions captain Brian O'Driscoll from last night's Off the Ball. Enjoy and we'll see you tomorrow morning. Now so Ireland victorious in New Zealand. They join an incredibly exclusive club it must be said. Maybe the most exclusive club in rugby. We have South Africa in 1937. We have Australia 1986 and we have France 1994 and now Ireland 2022. So uh, Lions in 71, the only other side to manage a series win on Kiwi soil. This is uh, rare and historic, to say the very least. Brian O'Driscoll, you're very welcome. Hey, Joe. Good to be here. It is insane when you realise it's South Africa in 37, Australia in 86, France 94, Ireland 2022, the end. Well, just think about how many tours must have gone through New Zealand. Um Sure enough, we had a lot, an awful lot goes through the noughties and um, and you know through the last last decade. But um, it is an amazing feat. It was a brilliant uh, one off in the second test to have won um, a, t- a test down there, which was huge. But that wasn't enough for this team. Um, they they really sensed you know um, that they were there for the taking and. Their performance in the third test was nothing short of exquisite. Like, it's funny, I was away at the Open over the weekend. I did manage to see the test uh, before I went down to the golf course. And as much as people were interested in talking about about Rory, everyone was was on a high, not just Irish people. Everyone was on a high on about the Irish performance. Um, it was certainly the first half was the best Irish performance I've ever seen. And, I, and I'll say the caveat that I'm saying, I almost think that the New Zealand performance in November was the best performance I'd seen before that. So this team is getting progressively better and continuing with those consistently high levels. Um, and now that, you know, what this will do to hopefully catapult them forward over the next year, all the messages about, you know, continued progression and learning and evolution, and, and that's all the important sound bites. but they've got to 
take heed of what they're saying too. But I think they have a game plan that's capable of doing that, where previously I think it was quite formulaic. I think this is now a case of just picking the right option of two or three that you create for yourself at different times throughout the game. So why, I mean, that's a big statement. Why was this the best 40 minutes of rugby you've seen from an Irish team? It was very compre- comprehensive. And I, I, and I said, I, was, I, I kind of thought at 20 minutes, God, we're only 5-3 up, how is that? It just didn't feel as though New Zealand um, had been given any access into the game. They kicked the ball away through, um, through being forced to do so. Jeez, I've never seen a New Zealand team putting up a Gary Owen from a line out 30 metres out. And I understand maybe they're trying they're trying different parts of their game, but it just felt that we rendered them devoid of, of ideas, you know, not in the second half, but relatively early on, um, you know, after 20 minutes, half an hour. And um, they did, did go to their kick game with mixed success. But I think it was the pressure, whatever about what we were doing in attack, and, and that's been largely heralded. I think what we're doing, our organization in defense, our ability to work with one another um, has, has really come on. I know we talked about it last week, but again, it was so evident with, um, with you know, the personnel in key positions and their, their setup, trying to get their close forwards in close to the rooks. But even when they were cut out, in the wider extremities, there's total comfort there in the system. Pressing hard, forcing teams into, into making decisions they don't want to make. Just so much good stuff to take from the defensive side as much as the attack. This is such an unbelievable turnaround the last uh, 12, 18 months in Andy Farrell's tenure. I distinctly yeah, well, remember talking to you early on mm-hmm. and you were, amongst others, remarking on the fact that there was no obvious attacking plan. You were trying to work out what they were trying to do and not coming up with much. And equally, there was a sense that the good parts of the Schmidt regime, like the breakdown work, that those aspects were slipping. It was like the worst of two worlds. And now here we are. I know it is amazing turnaround. And, and obviously that England game in the Aviva was the real catalyst. Uh, it felt like all the parts seemed to, to slip into place there. Um, and then I think they, they used the summer tour and the confidence derived from that. And then into the no- November internationals to really kick on. Um, yeah, I, I'll be the first to admit I, I I didn't see it coming because I I was trying to understand what the shape was, what they were trying to do, and you know it did take eighteen months. But you know you got to hold your hands up sometimes and go fair play to them. Stuck at it, they persisted, they put an awful lot of um, kind of. Um, of the focus on their senior player team uh, allowed them to really dictate what they wanted to play. I think they've, they're, they're playing heads up rugby. Like they said they were going to, but to a different level completely. And um, we thought there was going to be kind of a halfway house from what the Joe Schmidt era was with this heads up rugby. Um, but now I think the scanning and the ability of key personnel, being able to scan defensive systems and play heads up is, at a level that I'm not sure anyone else is playing currently. So, you know, I yes, you have to be mindful of not getting overly excited. We've been in this sort of territory yeah. before, but gosh, you got to enjoy being number one in the world and justified this time. You know, that that, that scanning and, and that heads up, maybe it's, it's it, you just planted a seed there touching my mind, but geez, it didn't half feel like New Zealand props were facing people they didn't want to face all that often. It, like, So is that Ireland manipulating things so that we see you yeah. and we're going to work things and we're coming your way? Well, a perfect example of that was um, was the third try. And there's a, there's so much to, to kind of pull apart in it. This is the Henshaw try, you know, a few minutes before half time. The setup was, um, you know, rarely do you see Hugo Keenan carrying the ball, but... I was trying to wonder, he kind of got stuck inside shoulder a little bit. Did he just not want to shove launch it? Um, so he carried, but I think he was meant to carry because Robbie Henshaw was clearly going to clear over him immediately. Barrett's the one that makes the tackle. But it's what happens next. It's Doris around the corner, but their willingness and ability to spring back to their feet and get out to position to strike again. It's difficult to do one and three, you know, to get that as a back to get into your, you know, outside positions having had a big involvement, particularly someone like Hugo Keenan, who's been tackled. 
But if you then look at the third phase, and it's, it's Barrett who made the tackle, who ordinarily should be the easier of the two to get up into the defensive line. He's late to get around. He runs around the, an arc rather than filling into the defensive line immediately. He runs out, is late getting off the line, and ends up going for an intercept because he's in no man's land. And counter that with Henshaw and the rebound of, of, of Keenan to get outside, hold enough depth to be able to play what the two players in front of them, Sexton first, then Bundy, and then and then Henshaw's in and, and scoring. And it could have been, if, if he was marked up, then if another player came in and defended him, it would have been a try to Keenan. So it's a desire, too, to get up off the ground and make an effort on that third phase. So a lot of the time, teams in the past would have gone one first phase and fourth to get up and have a, as big an impact as, of, as that with only one phase in between with quick rook ball is a testament to their um, fitness, their, their desire and their willingness to work really hard and, and catch the opposition off guard, which they did. By the way, Barrett's um, attempted intercept. I know he was caught in no man's land, but it was a, it banged a little bit of, you know, I've, I've got this. He's been there before. And he picked them off, and you've got to laud people when they're able to to um, to read that. But when they get it wrong, and and you know it's a catastrophe of their team, you got to call that up as well. I thought it was really, really um, sloppy defense from him, and a little bit selfish, thinking that he could pick it off. And he was trying to get into Johnny's head, and be, be careful to do that because I think Johnny, like nobody else at the moment, is able to pick that pass really late and and, and read shoulders and resh- read shapes and pick the right option. As a terribly unfair question, and uh, you're not a disinterested party, you haven't been there in 09. I, I think people are tempted to say this is the biggest achievement in Irish rugby. I, I don't, I couldn't possibly disagree with that. Um, obviously, we won three Grand Slams, um, the first one well before our time. It was a real um, momentous occasion in 09 to get to where we got to to eventually get to the holy grail of a Grand Slam we picked off victories against South Africa and Australia a bit more regularly throughout the noughties um, we left one behind in 07 but but the reality is that that only served as a catalyst for greater achievements um, other, and other Grand Slam these continual victories against um, the All Blacks but ultimately going and winning a series you know, two of three games then in New Zealand, you read out at the start of the show, you know, who the others are. Like, this is a really, really special thing that this group of players have achieved. So I would be, um, I certainly wouldn't be putting up any form of argument to say that this isn't the greatest achievement. But the great thing is that it feels like it's the scope to be the beginning of something, not just, not the end product, but that, this group, if they can continue with this level of progression, will cause every team at the World Cup mm-hmm. hassle. I'm not saying we're going to win it. I'm not saying we're necessarily going to go further, but they're going to continue causing real problems with the calibre of how the individuals and the collective are clicking. Yeah, and like there is such a temptation to say everything's about the World Cup and, and even uh, this series win has been greeted with, well, from certain quarters. It doesn't matter unless they do something at the World Cup. I... <laughs> I think that's like willfully ignoring the actual tradition and the history of the game where there are there are no glorified friendlies. These are test matches. The, the fact that only three countries have won in New Zealand speaks to that. This in and of itself is an extraordinary achievement. And I, I don't think it's such that in 18 months time, if they lose a World Cup quarterfinal, that this should be looked back on and say, well, look, that just proves it was nothing. This is not nothing. And anyone saying that is, I think, I think willfully ignoring the reality of the game. Of course, there would be massive naysayers in that regard. People are sharpening their eyes, can't wait for it again, hoping that you know we might get uh, France and at home or get a rejuvenated All Black team and to put us back in our box a little bit. But the reality is, I think you can look at them separately. This will never be taken away from them. You don't fluke two victories down there. Even the World Cup winning team, like the English World Cup winning team in 03, did manage a victory, but not two down there. So. This is significant um, out on its own. Um, And I don't want to kind of caveat that by future-proofing disappointment in a World Cup. We were still very expectant of this Mm. team to be able to go beyond a quarterfinal, irrespective of the opposition, such as where they are at the moment. But yet they're going to have to play an exceptional game. And even to go on to to greater things, all of a sudden now, 
we're not talking these I, I'd love to be a fly in the wall they're not talking about a World Cup semi-final in their heads they want to win it and it's it feels very un-Irish to, to do that because we haven't been in a World Cup semi-final but as we said on the show last week you know a losing World Cup semi-final is, is, a, is a disappointment right now yeah. and with a view uh, um, you know trying to draw the the, the analysis between which is a greater victory now no doubt a victory in New Zealand is greater than a lost World Cup semi-final of that I have no doubt and it was you know there's a lot of interest generated around this and on the back of what happened last weekend I'm glad I said what I said because I stand by it a World Cup final would be a greater achievement than a, a series win, but nothing short of that will will outdo this brilliant achievement and feat. Mm. It's funny. And I don't let talk people to you. let them enjoy it too. Let uh, us totally. all enjoy it. Totally. Let us enjoy yeah. it. And I, I agree with that totally. I know. Even pe- I was and guilty. People of are in fairness. Here. Yeah. People are sure. really people like South Africans, English, Welsh people, every nationality out besides Kiwis were thrilled at the weekend. It wasn't that Ireland won. It was the manner in which they won, the way they played, the standards, the quality, um, the tries, how they, they played New Zealand at their own brand. And that's the exceptional um, part of that series victory is mm. that, you know, particularly when backs to the wall, you know, 17-22, um, then it got to within three points, wasn't it? 24, yeah, was it 24-27 or, you know, um, like, you have to show balls to get to to come back from that mm. and take risk and be brave and go to the corner rather than kicking your goal. They're not insignificant decisions. So to to match up and, and deliver them and then subsequently deliver the try that you need from Herring and then keep that scoreboard ticking over, all of that is really it's you got to dig deep for that and in your in your reserves of belief. And this team has that in spades. Mm. Uh, the other very notable aspect of this tour, and we weren't sure in advance what way Andy Farrell was going to play it, is that Farrell has very much prioritised the winning of this series over World Cup preparation. Now, I, I guess the 2-1 win vindicates that. Uh, there's different ways to look at it. Like I, I did hear people saying at the start of the tour, he needs to be brave and to play the Carberries of the world and to play the lesser lights. In some ways, it's a very brave thing to risk playing your best team and maybe you lose the two or three nil and then where are you like you've got the worst of both worlds in a way he did quite a brave thing by saying i'm going to try and win this bloody series because the easy thing would be to play the lesser lights and then you've got a a foolproof excuse i'm building for the world cup so i think um that decision which was not a popular one i felt i I, my sense was people thought oh you've got to play the others you can't just play the best 15 uh that decision now looks um well one incredibly brave and it has been vindicated yeah, it has been vindicated. Who thought that Johnny was going to start all three test matches down there? No one. Mm. This was going to be those talk of 1-1-1. One, one, one. Remember, the forgotten man, Harry Byrne, was down on tour as well. All of a sudden, Frawley's the one that's probably emerged a little bit more. Joey came on the third test, and you know, I know he was only on for six or seven minutes, but looked solid and secure, and I, I think he's, I think he's very um, capable in that role, but I think there's... There will, no matter what, there will be a nervousness and a concern if we are to lose our um, leader and our captain and probably our best player and the focal point of the, of the of the team over the course of the next year. But we're going to have to, at some point, learn how to deal without them because um, you know you just can't. The reality is nothing changes. You can't because Johnny's managed to you know, navigate his way through this test series brilliantly. It doesn't mean that at other times he's not going to, he's going to be targeted all the more now. Mm. Teams realize how important he is to this team all the more. So he's going to be more targeted. And so we're going to have to give game time over the course of November um, and at Six Nations to Joey or somebody else. Like you just can't continue to giving Johnny time and, and not give Joey some, you know, proper 60, 70, 80 minute games to allow them, you know, high octane internationals as well, not the USA, not the lesser games. Um, 
because you, you wouldn't be left with egg on your face if you just put all your egg into eggs into one basket. And that's not just Ireland. I think other countries have to look likewise. You know, England, Marcus Smith, if they give him every test match from now to the World Cup, how well, it's different for them, I suppose, because yeah. Farrell goes in there and Ford's in there. But someone else that has a, a pretty inexperienced bench player, I think they've got to weigh up their, their options. And But yet you're allowed look and he's able to retrospectively look at those decisions as really great ones and maybe that gives him scope in this coming six nations to try people out a little bit more now that he's got the work in the bank that was the follow-up question there is a degree of okay you've gone after this tour and it's worked out beautifully but now six nations you really can't afford to do the same thing because like where are we like carberry harry byrne once again his injury profile is worrying you would have to say and now frawley's kind of emerged to put his hand up like he needs from Far- Farrell that is he needs to kind of figure out that pecking order and to invest in the Six Nations because there are no other opportunities now alright but here's a, here's a line of thought you know and at the risk of other countries saying god those Irish have really lost their own themselves and they're arrogant we've England and France at home um, you know a somewhat resurgent Wales Scotland not sure about Italy you know maybe on the up but is that potential for a Grand Slam year? Will jo- will Johnny Sexton be saying, do you know what, everything is the focus of World Cup. He'll be thinking uh, Grand Slam captain. He will. I know I know his mentality and he'll want to play and also not give an opportunity because he'll back himself to play five weeks on the bounce, you know, in game, the, you know, the second and, and third uh, group stage matches if they get beyond the quarter final to then play semi final final that's a nice headache to have when you get to that point but it's very hard when 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 you you get to each stage you know it's hard not to get greedy and go well we could still go and win that we could win that win that win that it's very hard to go no let's let's cut our cloth a little bit and not play the strongest team but it is something that they're going to need to do mm. Is it a ridiculous thing to say when we get to the World Cup, Sexton's not going to play in the group stages? I I, I don't see how he can't play in um, in the last two games. I, like I, I I think he'll obviously the way it falls. Obviously, we get South Africa second last. Depending on what what happens there, is there scope potentially for with a South Africa victory against South Africa in a perfect world? Um, him not playing the following week because there's pressure off. Because wh- who do you want in the qu- in the quarterfinal? France and New Zealand right now. It's mad that we're having that conversation. You know, ten years ago, like you'd bitten your hand off for France. Where it's, it, that's not the case right now, particularly with France at home and how good they have shown themselves to be and how much they're improving. So, um, yeah, I I think we're um, you know we're not sure where. Ideally, where we want to be, but I think as things evolve, I don't think he has to pick the Scotland team before the South Africa game. You know, you well, get a great victory against South Africa, maybe you can play somebody else and and run a small bit of a risk with the view that you're definitely in a quarter final and that you're going to have your, um, you know, your talisman to to kind of guide you through because. OTB AM with Gillette. Get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar 